And we are live. This is Dark Journalists. Uh, it's great to be here with all of you. It's a tremendous crowd already. Of course, I'm joined by the lovely Olivia. Hi, everybody. And we have a very special guest, which is Dr. Joseph Farrell. <laughs> Take two. <laughs> <laughs> Take two. <laughs> Uh, as everyone knows who tuned in last night, of course, the previous two interviews that I did with Dr. Farrell were removed. And Joseph, they were removed. I want to give you the official explanation <laughs> because supposedly we were impersonating a historical event. <laughs> <laughs> this is new. Yeah, this is very new. <laughs> a little different. <laughs> We've arrived. <laughs> <laughs> When do we get our stars at Grumman's Chinese Theater? You know, <laughs> it's just it's uh, just absurd. <laughs> it happened real early, and it happened on even different platforms. Uh, so there was something, and it was with both videos, not just uh, the one video, but the first one that went down was the Mars Elite video, and I thought that was interesting, where we really went deep into the Mars aspects, the big push around Mars that we're seeing uh, from Elon Musk and others. And it really is interesting that it's Mars. You know, he had a quote re recently where he said, I'm going to save the light of consciousness by getting us to Mars. Oh, <laughs> That's pretty esoteric, my friend. Yeah, it is. <laughs> kind of disturbing, too. <laughs> I should like to have Elon as the father of civilization. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no. Joseph, I'm going to go right in here with SpaceX and Otrok. Mm -hmm. And um, the bizarre similarity behind these rockets and this rocket program they developed in the late 80s mm -hmm. and what Musk uh, eventually wound up launching himself with SpaceX and some of the other weird things there. But what was OTROG and who are the people behind it? Well, OTROG stands for Orbital Raket und, uh, Raket und Transport und Gesellschaft. Uh, it's, a, it's obviously a German firm. And they set up in the mid-1980s, and all of this, incidentally, was brought out by Mikhail Gorbachev. All right. We wouldn't have even heard of Otrog or this compound in the Congo, which is kind of like the West German version of Area 51, right. if it had not been for Mikhail Gorbachev accusing West Germany of running this compound, building cruise missiles, bio-warfare capabilities, and everything else. But the firm itself was, was a firm that was designed to create booster rockets for very cheap launches. So if you go look at the pictures of some of those Otrog rockets, they're modular. Right. So you just fasten however many rockets you need to a central core to boost whatever payload you need. So that's that's Otrog. Interestingly enough, one of the people on the board of Otrog was Dr. Kurt Davis, whom uh -huh. you know we've talked about many times. Yes. Who was this... Uh, Nazi rocket scientist, so to speak, that was during the Apollo moon missions, he was the head of the flight planning at Cape Canaveral. So this is the guy that's in charge of the moon launches. Uh, Dr. Davis was also very peculiarly after shortly before he retired, he was placed in head as the head of NASA's UFO Bureau. Right. And then he retires and goes on the board to Otrog. Uh, if you know my books, um, Dr. Davis was also involved in some capacity, we don't know exactly what, in uh, a project having to do with the Nazi bell. Uh, mm -hmm. Kurt, Kurt Davis was not a rocket scientist. His specialty was high-voltage plasma and measurement. That's, you know, to me, a dead giveaway about the bell. Uh, he was a very close associate of, of Dr. Von Braun. So, you know, this Otrog entity, whatever it was, was, I think, certainly a part of the German deep state, you know, Black Projects world and all of that stuff, especially with someone like <laughs> Kurt Davis involved with it. Yes. And interestingly enough, you mentioned Elon Musk. Uh, if I remember correctly, Daniel, and I'm going on wobbly memory here, but about... Um, a year and a half ago, I think it was, someone sent me an article 
and I, I couldn't verify it, so I never blogged about it. But someone sent me an article that was tying Elon Musk to Otron somehow. Mm -hmm. And, you know, <laughs> how that yeah, works in there, I don't know. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's very suspicious. But you're right. There is a resemblance between what Otrog was up to, trying to create very cheap modular uh, launch vehicles, rockets for space, and what Elon Musk has been up to with SpaceX. So I have to wonder if if Otrog was somehow kind of a, a, a beta test of, of some cheap rocket launch capability that they've now farmed out to people like Bezos and, and Branson and Jeff Bezos and all these other people want to getting into space. Exactly. And th this is interesting because, of course, this brings in the whole secret space program aspect because we stopped going to the moon in 1972, mm -hmm. which is a great anomaly mm -hmm. uh, and a huge gap of time, 50 years to mm -hmm. next year. Um, and, you know, Pence, when he was in with Trump and they were putting things together, they said, with NASA, we're going back to the moon 2024. A couple of days ago, NASA said, hold on. Mm -hmm. The Pence plans are out. We're not going back to the moon on that date. Maybe later in the decade, we'll see. Mm -hmm. But Joseph, that got scratched. Mm -hmm. uh, so something's going on with the secret plan piece. And suddenly Mars has to be the complete dominant thing mm -hmm. as far as news coverage goes. Yeah, I find it very odd that we've had these these let's go back into space deadlines. And it, there's a pattern, as far as I can tell, Daniel. Uh, King uh, George Herbert Walker uh, Bush the first came out with that announcement. I think it was 1987 or 88. You know, we got to get back into space right away. And then Clinton's elected and that's out the window. Yeah. Then we get Bush the stupid elected, and we're, we we got to get back into space, you know, by such and such a date. Then along comes Obama, and that goes out the window. Right. And then Trump gets elected, and yeah, we got to get back into space. Uh, we've got to be on the moon by 2024, and we got to be on Mars by. So and now it's out the window again with Biden in office. So I have to wonder, is this all just, you know, make-believe bipartisan theater, or is there a real tug-of-war going on here? Mm -hmm. And and during this tug-of-war, the other thing that's been appreciably noticeable, as you're very well aware, is they've been coming out with all of these videos of UFOs and conferences, and they're pushing the ET meme, and it's all of a sudden Mars. Yes. So, you know, what, what's going on here? I have no idea, but I, I'm very suspicious of the pattern. No question. And, um, well, so many of your books in the Giza Death Star book series are about the ancient technology and basically mm -hmm. these wars in space that took place a long time ago. The Cosmic War in particular mm -hmm. uh, goes through that. And you've said that those books were laid out in a certain order mm -hmm. as well. Um mm -hmm. So the message for me is that it seems perhaps that there are ruins that they have discovered, mm -hmm. uh, say on Mars, for example. Mm -hmm. And you said once they discovered those ruins, something would have happened. And that would have been the deep state would have taken a look at that and said, yes. where are all the ancient documents on Earth concerned? Right. right. That's exactly what I think happened. Um, you, you can't tell me that you know, the, the, the face on Mars photo that Viking took, the very famous face, uh, that was noticed by two NASA scientists, and they originally thought exactly what the narrative later came to be. Well, this is just a trick of light and shadow. But then they found another picture that was taken by Viking from a different sun angle and a different position, and it's still there. So it's not a trick of light and shadow. Mm. And at that point... Uh, you know, NASA starts putting out the narrative that, well, this is just a big trick of light and shadow. But they're in doing so, and, you know, Hoagland laid all of this out in, in his numerous papers and, and, and books on the subject, that at this point, NASA is, is creating a narrative that pretty much went against its own scientists who discovered the pictures. Hmm. So at, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting is at that point, they realize we have a genuine anomaly here. Yeah. 
And that is going to require the deep state to take action and do some analysis that they're going to keep hidden from us. And I fully, firmly believe that as a part of that analysis, they're going to go back and look at ancient texts, you know, that, that Eric von Deniken, you know, people like that that were in the popular view at that time were talking about this idea. So they're going to do this. The other reason I think they're going to go back and, and look at ancient texts is you've got a UFO problem at the end of World War II, and they are, they are interfering with our national defense bases, particularly our nuclear bases, mm -hmm. you know, shutting down ICBMs or turning them on in the Soviet Union, you know, You're right. <laughs> take, take your pick. And, and this, is a, this is a genuine national security problem that they are going to have to study yeah. and take some sort of action on. There's, there's no way that they're going to ignore it, but we're not going to hear about it. So if they, if they all of a sudden realize we've got the possibility of, of some ruins here on Mars, then the implication is that implies a technology. And right. if you go back and look at the ancient texts, you know, I, I put a lot of them in, in the book, The Cosmic War, if mm -hmm. you, or Gives the Death Star um, Destroyed. If you look at those ancient texts, it's very clear, if you read them with modern eyes, that they are talking about a technology. Right. Very clear. I mean, in the Enuma Elish, you know, the so-called Babylonian creation epic, and I defy anybody to sit and read it and tell me that this is a creation epic. It's a war epic. Right. Pure, pure and simple. You know, uh, Quackademia likes to cover things up by giving it a name to make you think, oh, these people are just making all this up. It's Babylonian science fiction. No, it's not. Well, if you look at it, if you look at the Enuma Elish, you've got this big war between Marduk and Tiamat. And what's Tiamat fighting with? Well, she's fighting with biological weapons, mm -hmm. miscegenation, scorpion men, and, you know, all of this weird mm -hmm. monsters that, that she's cooking up in her cauldrons. Right. So in other words, we're doing this today with, with modern genetics. We're creating, we're creating these chimerical creatures. So it's not surprising that, that you would find it in a text related to a cosmic war, which you're going to have to have technology to fight. That's my point. Yeah. So these people are going to go back and look at these texts and, and realize that they've got a problem. And that's, I think, what's behind the scramble for Mars. They want to go out there and get that technology. Right. So uh, they're convinced that there's enough, or they probably already know at this point, that there's enough there that they can reconstruct the idea of what took place. Mm -hmm. So they're taking then those ancient texts, the Epic of Gilgamesh or something of, of that nature mm -hmm. as factual. They've, they've changed their perspective and realized, mm -hmm. oh, they're not mythical creations for academics. They are rather detailed histories. Right. They're, they're histories using language that, that the people recording them at the time had available. So you know, the idea that the idea that they're going to talk about scorpion men. Well, they they don't have a word for miscegenation, but that's what they're talking about. They're mm -hmm. talking about genetic engineering. So you kind of have to read these texts and bear in mind that you're either dealing with myth or you're dealing with people that are trying to record something very real in the language they had available. And that's what I think these people, you know, that would do this analysis actually did. And you know as well as I do, Daniel, that if you examine some of the photos coming from Mars recently, oh, yeah. they are just chock full of things that should not be there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know. No question. Yeah. Uh, and this is the kind of stuff that you've pointed out. You, you did mention that Hoagland was very early on this. Oh, yeah. Um, and one of the things that he got into with the whole complexes in Sidonia and, and that whole thing, which mm -hmm. look kind of like versions of Giza, but mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. um, there were also the strange comments uh, that Buzz Aldrin made in relation to some of the moons and mm -hmm. how they had found things there, mm -hmm. as if he couldn't kind of help himself. It spilled mm -hmm. out. So, um, and we've seen it echoed through movies like 2001 Space Odyssey and, and mm -hmm. all that kind of thing. So the mm -hmm. idea is there 
uh, it's out there in the culture as early as the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, When we look at it now, they've had years to study it in the last 50 with no public program except for you know, challenger shuttles and things of this nature, which are real fluff when you get mm-hmm. into a space program. What do you think marks the 50-year gap of space development that the public hasn't seen uh, in general? What's the kind of the core factor you think that is going on? I, I think the core factor is this this realization that that human history is not the, and I, I think I mentioned this in the previous videos, human history is not this accidental history of humanity being hunting, doing their hunting and gathering, and then all of a sudden quitting and deciding to invent mathematics and astrology and animal domestication and start Sumer and Egypt, you know, out, out of the clear blue, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is a narrative that never made sense to me. To be let's make honest. a geometrically perfect pyramid, everyone. Yes, let's make a perfect pyramid <laughs> out of out of copper and sand slurry and and diorite balls and you know hand saws. <laughs> <laughs> hey, the mines didn't even have the wheels, supposedly. Yeah, the mines <laughs> didn't even have the wheel. You know, the poor things. <laughs> just, just, good luck throwing those stones. Over yeah, there. good luck throwing those stones up. There. <laughs> yeah, go look at Chichen Itza and <laughs> tell me these people didn't have the wheel. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> But yeah, this is the problem. They they realize that that history is is uh, is not as as quackademia would have it, or they had to invent that history real fast because you know the end of World War II, you've got a bunch of stuff flying around the sky that's going to grab attention and make people wonder. The other thing I think that's at the core of this is the technology aspect. Once once you come to the conclusion that there was a high civilization and that it may have been interplanetary and that it fought a war and it was a terribly destructive one, Uh, you know, a blown up planet right here in our solar system. Once you come to those conclusions, then you would have to be totally irrational not to want to go out and get that technology, particularly at the height of the Cold War. Yes. Because, you know, if, if those records are true and that technology existed or there may be some of it left or enough information about it that we can piece it back together, we'd better get there before the dang Dariskis do. Right. You know, off and on and on we could go. <laughs> yes. Well, it's interesting because um, there's a CIA record that was declassified about them placing agents inside the ARE Casey Foundation. Mm-hmm in the 60s to try mm-hmm. to find out about what people knew about the Hall of Records under the mm-hmm. Sphinx and if that was real, because Casey mm-hmm. had said the Atlanteans left their records there about this two-eye advanced stone, this crystal that was a power station. Mm-hmm. Uh, so certainly there are things along. We know that they've searched for Noah's Ark, for mm-hmm. example. Mm-hmm. Um, so when they're engaged in this, in fact, a lot of the things that we see, it takes place very often in the Middle East. Mm-hmm. And um, we've also seen geopolitical situations there in the Caribbean mm-hmm. around this. Um, but they are engaged, in fact, in archaeological wars. Yes, yes. They're engaged, I think, I, I think what you're looking at, Daniel, is you're looking at the continuation of the Anan Erba Dienst. You know, that Nazi organization that sponsored all these archaeological projects and so on. But remember what Himmler said when he established it. He said that this is for the purpose of utilizing any potential military potential that it may represent. Wow. So in other words, we're looking we're looking at that same agenda just carried on into modern times, as far as I'm concerned. And you know, I I I totally think that the insertion of American forces into Iraq for the ostensible purpose of preventing Saddam Hussein from acquiring weapons of mass destruction. I think there was a certain truth to that because the way I look at it, part of the agenda, the hidden agenda there was to go into that country and see if they could find any of those records 
any of those cuneiform tablets, any of those hidden technologies. That's what I think Saddam Hussein was looking for. Oh, yeah. So they trot out Colin Powell and, you know, give a speech about weapons of mass destruction. And most people are going to think, oh, A-bombs and chemical weapons and biological weapons. They're not going to be thinking in terms of an ancient technology or information about it. But that, I think, was definitely one of the hidden agendas there. And the same thing with Mars. Yes, absolutely. Um, we know the looting of the Baghdad Museum was mm -hmm. bizarre on a number oh, of Totally. Times. Because ordinarily, they never would have allowed that to happen. No, never. And never. they had complete control uh, right. over those various things. And there was some confusion even about who was in there and looting. Right. And at a certain point, um, people said, oh, you know, these people are dressed up as Americans. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you've pointed out before that this is a literal switch of uniform. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, about who was in there, and the groups that were in there doing archaeology were, in fact, German, French, German, and French, French and German. yeah, French and German archaeological teams. And this is what makes me suspicious about that whole story. And my take on it is that that the archaeological teams themselves, which we before we went into Iraq, we told the French and we told the Germans, "Get your people out of there," and they did. But here's the problem. The Baghdad Museum looting was reported first by Der Spiegel in Germany, interestingly enough. Oh. And they're the ones that pointed out people, witnesses saw people in American uniforms going into the museum and hauling out these crates. All right. Well, anybody can put on an American uniform. Right. You know, <laughs> the Germans have an intelligent service, too. The French have an intelligent service, too. And they certainly know what our uniforms look like. Yeah. So, you know, they can they can dress anybody up and, you know, give a false flag. But the thing that interested me is that the Baghdad Museum incident, when it was first reported, they said that people knew exactly where to go and exactly what they were looking for. Now, here's the problem. The problem is that the archaeological teams themselves would be keeping field reports of what they find. In other words, you know, you're on an archaeological dig and you find something interesting at such and such a depth level and at such and such a location in your dig, and you write down the location of what you find, the depth at which it was found, a brief description of what was found, and so on and so forth. But no one, no one, Daniel, since the Baghdad Museum looting, has ever made reference to the field catalogs of those archaeological teams doing the digs. So no one. Really, it's really yeah, it's a glaring omission. Yeah, because if you're looking to recover this stuff, the first thing you're going to do is consult those field reports of the archaeological digs. And here's the problem. No one has. So I'm wondering if we even had access to them. Somebody did to go into the museum and haul that stuff out of there. And the finger of guilt points directly to the French and the German teams. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that would know what was in there. Absolutely. Well, it's interesting because Hussein seemed almost obsessed with oh, getting yeah. these archaeological digs. Yeah. And he had archaeological digs all over the place. Yeah, he had them all over Iraq. And I, I again, I think, you know, Hussein's not a stupid man. And he's going to be reading the same text that everybody else is reading and looking at, you know, looking at things like the Epic of Ninurta and say, oh, well, that's, that's a serious catalog inventory. Let's go find the stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so. uh, that's true. They found evidence of electroplating in oh, Iraq. Yeah. I yeah. remember that. Yeah. And the Baghdad battery. The Baghdad battery, you know, and uh, all of the other weird stuff that you see on those cylinder seals. Um, I just, uh, just before we came on air, someone sent me an email of an article that they found a cylinder seal. And I looked at this thing and Daniel, I, I'm so, I'm so gobsmacked by, by what's on this cylinder seal that I have to wonder if it's even real. Did somebody just make this up for a joke? Wow. What's because on? what's depicted on the seal is a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it looks like the fat man plutonium bomb that we dropped on Nagasaki. Wow. That's what it looks like. Incredible. And then next to it, there's this tree-like thing 
that could also be a mushroom cloud. And inside the, the, the mushroom part of the cloud, there are all these little arrows, like, you know, lightning bolts and stuff. And I'm thinking, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, <laughs> either someone's having a pretty good joke here or this cylinder seal exists and it's depicting something that, you know, shouldn't be around in the fourth. I would love to say this. By the way. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> just, I, you know, I, I'll blog about it probably next week because, you know, it it's one of those stories that it, you have to speculate about, you know, you just, you just have to. So here you have a bomb in a mushroom cloud. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's just, and it wouldn't surprise me. We do know that in Egypt, you go to Dender in Egypt and look at some of those so-called hieroglyphics oh, yeah. and you're looking at jet airplanes and helicopters yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and Tesla coils <laughs> <laughs> moving right on down the line too. moving it's right like, on down the line <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> anyway so yeah I think well I, what's interesting for me about this is uh for example with the epic of Ninurta some of the things that they say in there are incredible one of the mm -hmm. things you've pointed out is that they say you know what here's an inventory of the weapons you need to destroy. Oh, guess what? We actually don't know how to destroy this. So what are we going to do? We're going to hide it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this thing is so powerful. There's no way to just bury it. No, right. They have and, to kind of actually get rid of it. And here's the problem. Let's, let's go back to something I mentioned in the videos that were taken down because we're impersonating historical <laughs> events. <laughs> But I still want my star in Hollywood by the way, guys. <laughs> you deserve it. <laughs> so, well, the we best impersonator. I'm trying to figure out, by the way, which event we were impersonating. Yeah, I, I, you know, give us, give us a hint here, guys. <laughs> Is it the moon landing? I, I don't know. <laughs> Mars well, we, rover? We were yeah. talking about moon landings and alternative three and everything else. So who knows what <laughs> yeah, it was getting pretty out. There. Was getting, but anyway, <laughs> here's the problem. Um, you know, if they're hiding, if they're hiding some of this stuff according to the epic of Nerdo, then where are they hiding it? Where's the yeah. likely place? Well, if you're looking on planet, the likely place would be obviously somewhere in Mesopotamia mm -hmm. or maybe Egypt, who knows? But if you're thinking in terms of off-planet civilizations, well, one place to hide it would be the moon or Mars. Yes. And here's what I find so uncanny. If you if you read the Epic of Ninurta, you've got this Babylonian god that's named Nergal, N-E-R-G-A-L. Right. Nergal is the Babylonian god of Mars. He's their god of war. Nergal, if you look at the derivation and follow the name through history, Nergal becomes Erdekal in Babylonia. Erdekal becomes Hercules mm. in the Greek mythology and later becomes Ares in, in, in Rome. So in other words, you're dealing with the same dude here. Right. <laughs> so, so anyway, the creepiest thing uh, that I ever encountered, one of the creepiest things I ever encountered was when Richard Hoagland first began looking at the face on Mars and created his Mars mission project and got all of these experts together to, you know, help put together a case for why this was not just a trick of light and shadow. He had an artist do a profile of the face on Mars based on computer modeling and so on and so forth. And you look at that profile and then compare it to a little picture of Nergal from Babylonian reliefs, oh. and the resemblance between the two is, uh, I put it in, in Giza Death Star Destroyed, this, mm -hmm. this comparison. The, the, the resemblance between the two is palpable and chilling. Interesting. So if there's, you know, I'm thinking if there's a place you're going to look for some of this stuff, go to Mars. Mars. Um, it's interesting because, of course, von Braun wrote mm -hmm. a science fiction novel Mm -hmm. about a civilization on Mars and his character, the leader of Mars was named Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Apparently he had the ability to predict things there, Joseph. Apparently he did. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know if many people know this Von Brown's mother 
was reputed to be a very good psychic. Interesting. But what I find even more interesting is given given von Braun's connections, you know, with what I've been calling Nazi International, is he really is he really being precognitive or is he letting out a little detail that he just happens to know about? And right. my bet my bet's the latter. Yeah. Because again, you've got that strange article. I'll have to find it about Otrog and Ellen <laughs> Otrog and Ellen. <laughs> Well, he'd been known to let things out before. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons you suggested he got fired from NASA uh, was because he had actually let out something about the moon mission that wasn't known. Right. Which was about the, the shape of the moon. No, it's the gravity. The gravity. There was a Time magazine article shortly after the moon landing where they put one of these boxes, you know, like they do at the bottom of the page. And in the box, they had done a little interview with, with Dr. Von Braun. I remember this. I, I, I saw it. You know, that's when I decided to write Von Braun. You know, I'm 13 years old and hey, you know. <laughs> so I wrote him. <laughs> What's up? Did you get a response? That's... Oh, yeah. He wrote a very nice letter. Oh. Back. <laughs> he didn't answer my question, but he wrote back. <laughs> that's great. But, but anyway, you know, I'm like, what's going on here, Werner? <laughs> but but he wrote, he, he gave a little interview and he said that the equigravosphere, you know, the neutral point of gravity between the Earth and the Moon's gravitational fields was somewhere around 23,500 miles from the surface of the Moon. And I'm like, what? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Because that means the Moon is much more massive than we've, uh, pardon me, much less massive than we've been told. Uh, pardon me, I got my figure wrong. He said it was 43,500 miles from the surface oh. of the moon, not 23,000. So that means the, the moon is much more massive. And I'm thinking, okay, there went right out the window all of those weekly reader articles that I used to read when I was a kid in elementary school about, you know, the astronauts on the moon being able to leap to tall buildings and drive golf balls, you know, <laughs> <laughs> because the gravity is too dense. Uh, and if that's the case, how do we get off of it? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, getting off of it was always bizarre anyway. Oh yeah. That's, you, you know, pointed out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Getting up there is one thing. Yeah, getting um, off is the other problem. Just and if you're dealing with, if you're dealing, here's the problem. If the moon is more massive for whatever reason than we've been told, or it has these mass cons, these concentrations of mass beneath the surface of the moon, which is documented, that would explain why all of those early Soviet and American probes went either careening wildly by the moon and shooting off into space or slamming into it mm -hmm. because they're dealing with the wrong figures. All right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And they yeah. probably, uh, we probably enjoyed the fact that they had the wrong figures. Well, at least for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Especially those groups inside of NASA that were known to really hate the Soviets. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, exactly. Let me ask you this when we're talking about this aspect, which is, you know, you were citing this like Hercules Mars, you know, thing. So let's go into the kind of occult window on this for a mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. When we look at Mars, the symbolism of any other planet is, you know, th this is the one that is the war god. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what are they doing promoting Mars on this level? Um, why is Mars the goal for civilization? And, you know, Bezos was talking and he said, from now on, we're going to have people living on Mars and living in space. And, you know, only certain people will live on the earth. It'll be like a resort, mm -hmm. this kind of talk. Mm -hmm. um, what is it that's going on there mythologically, uh, symbology? What are they doing with that? My suspicion, that's, that's an excellent question. And I, I have thought about it and, the one thing that stands out in my mind is that with the emphasis on getting back to Mars and establishing a human colony there, 
that it's ultimately an act of rebellion. Because if you look at Mars in mythology, it's always not only connected with war, but in some cases, particularly in, if you look at the way the Babylonian texts treat this cosmic war, it's, it's really kind of a civil war in the pantheon of gods. Right. And a certain segment of the pantheon is in open rebellion against the rest. It's Tiamat versus Marduk. And you get a hint of that even in some of those uh, passages in the Enema at least after the war, Mar it says that Marduk remeasured the structure of the deep, hmm. which is a very, very telling phrase if you're approaching this from the standpoint of, of a physics that's being talked about. Because all of a sudden you're missing a planet in the solar system. That's going to interfere with the celestial mechanics of, of the solar system from that point out. It's going gonna, it's gonna to knock it all into a cocked hat. And you're going to have to reestablish order. Well, if you look at the god Marduk, he is really kind of a god of order. He's kind of a, a descent, if you will, from Enlil, you know, the great Babylonian god of order. Mm -hmm. And so Marduk is reasserting this order after Tiamat's rebellion and all of that. So I think I think part of it is this this quest for power, for ultimate power, and looking at it mythologically, a kind of a rebellion against established order. So that's part of it in my thinking. And you know, Bezos coming out and saying, "Well, a few of you lucky folks might get to." get to continue to live on earth but we're going to ship the rest of you off into prison like conditions on mars <laughs> nice guy yeah a real nice guy <laughs> i think uh you know paying those amazon warehouse workers 12 bucks an hour has gone to your head yeah yeah exactly <laughs> exactly you know uh what's what are we what are we laboring for here jeff is you know right exactly. you know space colony slavery right space yeah. colony slavery there we go yeah um this is i don't even right. fly <laughs> <laughs> i don't want to get on a rocket thank you <laughs> very much <laughs> you've made a point um about you know a lot of the things that they're claiming they will do with space with chemical rockets don't make sense no uh, asteroid mining and no. things of this nature it's not I gonna mean, happen i mean come on did you see the cartoons and i i'm re i'm literally using that word advisedly did you see the cartoons that nasa came up with when they first started talking about going out and mining asteroids did you see some of the artist's pictures they, you know, yeah, yeah. Remember, remember those big Dixie cups? That they were <laughs> yeah. Go out there and scoop up these <laughs> asteroids with chemical rockets. And I'm, I'm like, guys, come on! Not all of us are this stupid. It ain't gonna happen. It's just not. So yeah, I. You so know, they're still using the cover story of the chemical rocket. Yeah, they're still using the cover story of the chemical rockets, but you're not going to be able to mine asteroids with chemical rockets and make it, in my opinion, cost effective. And the other thing we've got to remember, we've had, you know, ever since the end of World War II, we've essentially had a secret space program going on with lots and lots of money sloshing around in the system to build, all, you know, God knows what, underground bases, you know, um, ionic propulsion who knows but it ain't going to be chemical rockets that are doing this there's just no way um absolutely i mean it, even during the nazi period they were working with other technologies yes. and that's 70 80 years ago yeah and again you had a two-track space program there you had the rockets you know von braun and you know, once the rockets are up, who cares where they come down? You know, just like the, <laughs> the Tom Lehrer song. But then you also had this very exotic technology that they were working on. You know, with things like the Bell. Um, so you had a two-track system there early on. Yeah. And interestingly enough, you know, you look at some of those Nazis that that I think were writing about that exotic technology. And they were already thinking, let's use this in, in psychological warfare. Oh, and, nice. yeah. So, you know, 
shades a little shade of project blue beam there you know, yeah right if you right want to get down to it yeah they were ready then yeah. well is it fair to characterize a lot of the nazi space program as controlling things on the ground from space basically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think so yeah mm -hmm. um i want to dip back into this archaeological piece for a second it's a story mm -hmm. that you told me um and it relates to this book, The Thrice Great Hermetica, which is oh, an interesting book where you, you go through so many different eras. It's quite fascinating, and I want to recommend it for people who haven't seen that one. Um, but in there, there's a story that you bring out, and it's, it's in the later part of the book, about the Germans doing this kind of quest for the grail. Mm -hmm. and uh, the Nazi party being very obsessed with this, them also mm -hmm. having a very sharp identification with sacred objects in general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's the whole story about this crown and mm -hmm. the Templars mm -hmm. that I thought was interesting on that front. Can you give us a little bit of that story? Yeah, there was a German um, scholar by the name of Otto Rahn, R-A-H-N, that was very interested in the story of the Templars and the Albigensian Crusade and, and all of that that occurred in, in southern France, which was was nothing less than, than a genocidal... Uh, there's, there's no other way to interpret it. It was a genocidal crusade to get rid of the Albigensians. And Otto Rahn had been in southern France because he was looking for the grail. He thought that uh, Wolfram von Eschenbach's Parsifal, the medieval story of the grail, was actually based on history, and it was based on the Albigensian crusade against the Cathars. And he came back to Germany, he published a book, and then the book caught the eye of one Heinrich Himmler. You know, talk about a man you don't want to <laughs> don't want reading your attracting <laughs> his attention. His attention. <laughs> so Himmler actually contacted Ron, inducted him, forced him basically to be inducted into the SS and sent him back to southern France to, you know, continue searching. And if you read Ron's books, uh, they're they're very very interesting. Um, the guy was clearly onto something, but he he ran across a local French shepherd down in the Languedoc, and the shepherd told him, "Oh yeah, we know all about that crusade. They what they were looking for were the jewels in Lucifer's crown, and that." really grabbed Ron's attention because Ron had come to the conclusion that the way that the grail is described in, in Parsifal was as a stone, mm -hmm. not, you know, not a, not a cup. A stone. Yeah. And to me, that's a very interesting thing because Ron, or pardon me, the shepherd told Ron that actually Pope Innocent the third, the man behind that, genocide, wanted that stone for a stone to put in the papal tiara. Oh, wow. You know, talk about... Talk Incredible. about... Yeah. Well, I think it's interesting because if you look at the stones in Lucifer's crown, they're the same stones that you find on the ephod of the Hebrew high priest. They're oh, exactly, really? Yes, they're exactly the same. And supposedly, Lucifer lost one of these stones in his crown at when he fell, and Innocent the Third was looking for it and thought it was thought it was in the Long Dock, which I find very interesting, because there there have been reports of people trying to find these these stones from the crowns, and you know you've got you've got a parallel in in um, Tolkien's Silmarillion with Morgoth's crown. Or Melkor's mm -hmm. crown and the missing Silmaril, the stone. Oh, yeah. So you know, it's it's very very interesting lore that's out there, and for Himmler to latch on to it is very very interesting because this this tells me that Himmler was already thinking there's something down there and we got to go get it. Mm -hmm. And the story ends in 1944. Get this. 
ends in 1944 when they send Otto Skorzeny, Hitler's favorite commando, to the Long Dock to look for something. Reportedly, uh, Skorzeny telegraphed Himmler, we found it. Himmler then, and this was after Himmler had dispatched the von Zalza SS regiment to the Long Dock. Now, that name should ring a bell because Konrad von Zalza was the first Grand Master of the Teutonic Knights. Oh, yeah. Oh, so, you know, there's symbolism. <laughs> all, yeah, there's symbolism yeah. all over this place. Yeah. So supposedly, Skorzeny telegraphs Himmler, we found it, and then Himmler sends this airplane skywriting over the Long Dock. I don't remember what it was supposedly skywriting. And then uh, Skorzeny and company abandon the Long Dock because the Allies had just invaded southern France. Fascinating. And, you know, this is another part of the story that gets shoved aside. Um, there was no military reason, none whatsoever, for the Allies to launch an entire D-Day-sized invasion of southern France. By that point, the German armies in France are collapsing and they're hightailing it back to the Reich as fast as they can. And I've always suspected, you know, I'm not the first one to suspect something here. Senator Joseph McCarthy pointed out that this was a useless, unneeded invention on the floor, invasion on the floor of the Senate. Yes. But, but I speculate that, no, we knew that the Germans were looking for something. So we went into southern France uh, to find out what, you know, just what the heck are they doing down there? It's the archaeological wars. It's the archaeological war again, which often piggyback on the back of the real thing. Yes, exactly. exactly. Um, that's really fascinating. The quote from McCarthy's odd too. Because... Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sure is. He's, he's getting into some stuff there, and it's like, what are you talking about exactly? Well, Senator McCarthy, when when I read this, Daniel, I I just you know. I, I had read this speech before, many years before, but it didn't register with me. So when I was doing the McCarthy book, I went back and reread it. And I just thought, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, here's Senator McCarthy on the floor of the United States Senate giving this long speech about General Marshall. And he's he's excoriating Marshall for this unneeded, unnecessary invasion of southern France, and he was not alone. This is important to remember. General Mark Clark, the Allied commander of uh, Allied forces in Italy, asked the same question. Why, why are we invading there? You know, that's useless. But McCarthy gives this long speech about Senator, uh, about uh, General Marshall, and at the very end of this speech, there's this odd little reference. This is just plopped right in there <laughs> about uh, the Merovingian in the White House may know. And of course, Merovingians, here's a Roman Catholic senator dropping a very esoteric, abstruse reference to the Merovingian dynasty of France. Yeah, you know the dynasty that preceded Charlemagne, <laughs> dropping dropping this reference into a speech on the floor of the United States Senate and using it to refer to President Truman. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> now, folks, I don't care what you think about Senator McCarthy, one way or the other, but to drop that reference, that's sending a message. Yeah, that only he and Truman probably ever really knew. Uh, the full extent of what that message was. But given the fact that suddenly, years, decades later, we have Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code and, right. and you know, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, and that whole thing with the Merovingians. And here's Senator McCarthy, you know, <laughs> 30 in the 50s there, in, yeah. In the 50s, talking, <laughs> talking about Merovingians, Southern it's so France, strange. It really Southern is. France and invasions. Of, yeah, it's, it's not just strange. He knew something. Yes. He knew something. It just stands out dramatically yeah. Oh, yeah. in the middle of that. And he's pressing also that general basically saying, you had no reason to go into right. southern France. Right. 
obviously he knew that that the military reasons were off the table. So right. he wanted to bring all of that out. And this is a weird thing that you've mentioned in relation to McCarthy. I wanted to do a little aside on that because you've done a few very interesting books on McCarthy. But McCarthy also, as you found out, gets deep into the UFO file. Oh, yeah. And he's talking about Project Blue Book in 1953 and 1954. Yeah, he's talking about 52 during the Monmouth Committee hearings. Um, you know, Blue Book was not even really that publicly known. And right. 1952, you know, the context here for, for what McCarthy was doing is just astonishing to me because that's the year of the big UFO flap in Washington, D.C. Yes, and here's McCarthy running his probe of, of communist penetration of Fort Monmouth, which is doing all of this exotic radar research. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden he stumped, and, and folks, you've got to understand, these transcripts that I'm referring to of his hearings about Fort Monmouth were not declassified by the United States Senate until 2003 under Senator Joseph Lieberman. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's another a hole. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, you know, Lieberman was the chairman of the same committee that McCarthy was chairman you know, only decades later. But it was finally declassified in 2003, which, you know, when I made that discovery and found those transcripts were available, I thought, well, no wonder I haven't been able to find them all these years. The Senate was sitting on them. Right. So let's go read what old Joe was up to. So I buy the, the transcripts, you know, ended up being in a binder book about yay thick. And I'm reading through this stuff, and I'm getting all of a sudden McCarthy asking, oh, well, uh, were your radar experts perhaps down in New Mexico and say it like, oh, maybe July of 1947? <laughs> 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 you know, and again, this is over and over. This is not a one-off. He, yeah. He's pressing on this connection to New Mexico in July of 1947. Think Roswell, folks. Right. Um, you know, th this is not a stupid man. And he had an ironclad memory. I mean, he was well known for his ability to pull details out of his head. So this is this is not unusual. And then we get these curious references to Blue Book when he starts probing, well, where are these missing documents? Why did you re destroy top secret documents? Where is the register for these? You know, on and on this goes. And the army is literally stonewalling. So I think McCarthy, you know, he drops his Merovingian bomb. He's dropping little Roswell bombs <laughs> <You're right. laughs> in, the middle, in the middle of these hearings. And the army, you know, the army is frustrated. It doesn't know what to do. And I think this is one of the reasons they set him up in, in the army McCarthy hearings and brought him down. He was getting close uh, to the UFO file, as you call it. Uh, there's there's no question. You can read the transcripts. If you can come to another conclusion, have at it. But I don't think there's any way to avoid it. Oh, it's fascinating. And the, what fascinates me about reading those books is that it's Roy Cohn mm -hmm. who's there with McCarthy, and he's pushing mm -hmm. hard mm -hmm. on these guys. It's almost like interrogation. Yes, it is. It is, especially especially as you say when Cohn is is doing the questioning. And again, you know, who's Cohn connected with? Donald Trump. Trump. Yeah, Donald Trump. No question. And um, he shows up in those, the weird documents about DISC that yes. are released in the Torbett document. Yes. And he's associated with Defense Industrial Security Command. Yes. Um, so Cone, he sort of has a continuation mm -hmm. <laughs> there. He comes out of the McCarthy thing, knowing about Blue Book and all the rest. And then he's mm -hmm. part of DISC, which is, mm -hmm. again, part of that industrial security command about mm -hmm. the ufo file and good friend with the reagans yes <laughs> yeah. or cone is that inside piece and i think that he's the key also to trump's entree into the political world oh i absolutely agree i absolutely agree uh trump tower in new york city would not have been built if it were not for roy Cohn's influence it just would not have happened so, in other words, the, the connection there is very, very strong and it's very deep. Yes. And as, you, as you've said many times, Cone is the original swamp creature. <laughs> he um, is. He indeed. really is. <laughs> Does it get any swampier than Cone? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Not in my opinion. <laughs> Joseph, there's something that's a very interesting tie-in. It just came out, and I, I want to get uh, some of your quick responses on this. We haven't had a chance to talk about this. 
But um, Judge Andrew Napolitano was speaking with Gerald Solente recently, mm -hmm. and he's talking about his relationship, his phone calls with Trump. And he mentions, uh, because for a while there, they were friends and they were working together and they had a falling out eventually. Mm -hmm. But he mentions the period when the uh, Kennedy records are going to be released, October 26, 2017. And he said, I was on the phone with the president. Mm -hmm. And I said, are you going to release those documents because the public needs to know and all the rest? And that Trump said to him, and this is his quote, he said, Trump said, if you knew what was in those records, you would know that I can't release them. Now, we know that Trump did release some of them, but the CIA like, went in that morning and blocked all the records from their end. Mm -hmm. So um, Napolitano pressed him and Trump said, Andrew, trust me, the things that I've seen in those records, we could never, you would know, you wouldn't release them either. Mm -hmm. So um, my mind instantly went to the kind of catty, UFO file mm -hmm. explanation mm -hmm. piece. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, because we know that the CIA would have tried to extricate anything out of there and right. make themselves look good. Um, I had a thought, which is speculation, but that the CIA director that the Kennedys put in might have left something in there that they just, you know, it was an ironclad thing when possible to remove. So their best game, their best play was to just block it from release. What do you think of those comments? I, well, I'm not surprised. And like you, I'm inclined to think that it has something to do with the UFO file. Because let's look at the constellation of, of connections here in the big picture. Uh, we've got McCarthy at Fort Monmouth doing his, his probe and over and over again, the UFO issues coming up and it's coming up. It's important for people to understand this. McCarthy is a, is a very smart man. And when he starts probing these types of areas, he will always speak in code. Mm -hmm. So in other words, he's not he he doesn't blurt out Roswell. He blurts out July 1947 over right. and over and over again. Uh, you've got the UFO flap going on in 1952 as the hearings are taking place. So in other words, this is not a stupid man. He knows what he knows what he's dealing with. And then you've got Kennedy, who is through his brother Bobby closely associated with McCarthy. Right. Okay. The Kennedy family was very, very closely associated with McCarthy, donated money to his campaigns. Bobby Kennedy secretly visits McCarthy's funeral, and on and on we could go. Uh, John Kennedy conveniently sidesteps the censure vote against McCarthy, so, you know, arranges that he doesn't have to be there. All right, it's time for back surgery. Yeah, yeah it's time for back surgery now. <laughs> that, was, that was a good move. <laughs> it really was, you know. But then Kennedy gets into office after Eisenhower's military industrial complex speech, which I'm sure they talked about, you know, in their private discussions before Eisenhower left the White House. And then Kennedy comes out, I think it's in mid-1961, thereabouts, where he orders the CIA to go through their entire UFO files and find out which ones can be pulled to share with the Soviets because he wants to have this joint moon mission with the Soviets. And Nikita Khrushchev is just about ready to give in to that when Kennedy is assassinated and Khrushchev is placed under house arrest and overthrown. You know? right. Yeah, right. <laughs> that was pretty fast. Yeah, that was, you know, it was, it was lightning speed after the assassination. Um, so I think, I think there's a UFO connection hovering in the background of all of this. I, I, I'm, I'm in agreement with you. Plus, we have that strange association between, as you pointed out, between the owner of the Texas School Book Depository, Colonel Bird, mm -hmm. a relative of Admiral Bird, right. of Operation High Jump fame. Folks. Yes. You know, on and on we could go. So I think this whole thing, you know, Kennedy managed to piss off so many people, but the the core of it, the 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 deepest and hardest core of it is, I think, having to do with UFOs and space. Yes. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that that's the case. It's like the gigantic historical omission 
yes. there. And that's how we get into the situation in 2021 where you have the CIA trying to run phony UFO disclosure, and we still don't know right. anything. Right. Um, right. It's fascinating to me, and I, I, I do want to get into this a little bit deeper because uh, Kennedy, on a certain level, dealing with this, he is saying, oh, I'm going to open this up. I'm going to share this information with the Russians. Mm -hmm. And that whole group that's inside NASA, which already constitutes a kind of secondary space program. Right. They're already kind of doing their own experiments and their own stuff. And von Braun is in the in the heart of that. Right. Um, and this Davis character, of course, he's in the middle of that as well. Mm -hmm. um, when the death of Kennedy is investigated later in the 60s, and it's 67 when the Garrison investigation, everything that he does, and remember the records that are blocked, all 12 of the files on the CIA side about Garrison are all blocked. Jefferson Morley is that Washington Post reporter uh, who put those details together. So you can't get the Garrison files. Um, but it's interesting to me because, and you pointed it out, which is Garrison runs over and over again into aerospace and the U.S. Yes. file, which doesn't make any sense to him. Yeah, it doesn't. He, Garrison runs into three things. And if you look at what the three things are, it's very peculiar. He runs over and over again into aerospace. He runs over and over again into these weird church associations hovering around David Ferry and uh, Guy Bannister yes. and those people. And then he runs into this very strange financial system that seems to be somehow coupled in. You know, he calls it Murder Incorporated. And that's, yeah. that's where we get the phrase is from Jim Garrison and this whole Permandex mm -hmm. outfit and so on. So in other words, Garrison stumbled across the same network of connections that Kennedy ran into. Kennedy, yeah. let's remember, Kennedy decides in June of 1963 to have the Treasury print up $4 billion worth of United States notes debt-free notes, bypass the Federal Reserve completely. I mean, well, it's incredible. Yeah. It's incredible. And in retrospect, I think Kennedy knew to some extent that there's some sort of hidden system of finance backing all of this weird aerospace stuff up. Right. I, I really do. And he's coming off of Eisenhower and Eisenhower's disgust with the military-industrial complex and on and on we could go. So Garrison stumbles into the same network of connections that he's really investigating are behind the murder of the president. So again, I, I, I don't see that you can look at the Kennedy assassination and come away from it without at least having an awareness that space forms some big component of what all of that was about. And as you say, here we are at the end of this arc of American history that begins with that assassination. And what are we hearing? Oh, well, we've got a UFO problem. There are ETs up there on Mars or wherever, and they're flying this stuff around our skies. Right. And it's all coming out of the CIA. Yeah, right. <laughs> a trustworthy branch of government. A trustworthy right? branch of government, <laughs> if there ever was one. With honorable officers like Lou Elizondo. Yeah. Like that. It's just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the drone king, you know. It's just, <laughs> But, well, you know, John Brennan cares deeply about the UFO file. I want to mention something to you here, um, which is about Avril Haynes, the director of national intelligence, who was known as the drone queen because <laughs> she was she was Brennan's undersecretary there. She's his deputy going on. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting to me. Uh, so she comes out yesterday, and we did a program on this last night. This just happened now. They did the UAP thing in Washington, and she was sitting down there, and she said, well, it seems like they could be extraterrestrial. And she messed up the word strangely, and I thought, oh, that's a weird thing for her to do. She stumbled on it. But UFOs buzzing U.S. warships may be aliens, right? That's the headline there. And there mm -hmm. she is. So, you know, that sends ripples around the world, of course. You've got the director of national intelligence, which is supposed to be the top of the whole branch. We know the CIA actually rules and the DNA is kind of this overlay. But anyway, she's basically the mass coordinator of all our intelligence and she's saying it's aliens. So the Russians are sitting back there and thinking, what? That's the question to me? <laughs> yes. Okay, sit down. <laughs> 
pour pour yourself three fingers of your favorite adult beverage. <laughs> If I were the Russians, here's what I'm thinking. Let's assume I'm an FSB analyst and I'm looking at this theater of disclosure, if you want to use that word, coming out of the United States about UFOs and ETs. Right. My question is, where is that Chinese defector? All right. What in the name of sense has he been telling the Americans? This was the head of Chinese counterintelligence, which means that this man probably had deep insight into China's UFO files, which China doesn't talk about very much. Exactly. And he defected not to the CIA, but to the DIA, ah. which was the very agency that John Kennedy started because That's he didn't true. trust the CIA. <laughs> Excellent point. <laughs> so I'm wondering, I, I really am, Daniel, why have we heard no more about this man? What exactly is he telling them, and why is the CIA reacting with all of this UFO talk? I think there's a connection, in other words, between his defection and what we're seeing now, and they are either prepping a narrative because they don't like what he's telling them, or they're trying to get ahead of whatever it is that will eventually come out. This man is very important to this whole UFO story, I think, in my opinion. If you're the head of Chinese counterintelligence, that's the desk that's going to be handling anything UFO-related for the People's Liberation Army. Absolutely no doubt in my mind. And it raises the question of why did he choose now, now to defect? What's yeah. going on there? You know, uh, there's, there's something going on, and I think definitely it could be UFO related. Absolutely. China's wow. when you when you look at the, the announcements that the Chinese space program has made since that defector defected, it's bizarre. Yeah. Because China's saying, oh, we want to build a kilometer long mothership up, <laughs> up there. <laughs> And, you know, they're testing all of these hypersonic missiles. And meanwhile, there's all these explosions happening inside China that China's not talking about. Right. Um, something is going on, and I think it's UFO related. And moreover, I think if you look at these explosions in, in, in China and Russia in the past few years, I think we're in a hot war of some sort. I really do. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I thought when that Tianjin uh, chemical plant exploded a few years ago and looked at the crater of that thing, I thought, no, that's not a chemical explosion signature. That's a deep penetration deep into the surface of the earth. So something's going on, and uh, I don't know what it is. Um, trying that defector into the UFO side, that makes a lot of sense because we've gone into a whole weird zone around yep. UFOs where this media, this government, they can't talk enough about UFOs after completely dismissing the subject for 75 years. Yep. Um, yep. And it's a very uneasy thing, and it was very clumsily done when they rolled in there and they were like, you know, here's this goofy TTSA and here are all these New York Times articles. And... Um, it was interesting. The first thing I noticed when the TTSA came out was the presence, the open presence of CIA officers mm -hmm. on the board. Mm -hmm. They had over 100 years of CIA office experience, mm -hmm. officer experience, uh, over 100 years on their board. I mean, you know, that's not just like, hey, we have one CIA advisor. It's like the whole thing is a CIA outfit. Mm -hmm. And um, now something interesting is happening, which is about Avi Loeb, because it seems like they were pushing the UFO threat there they were trying to get this in the media and hyped up. And somehow with the UAP uh, report from last June, that sort of fizzled mm -hmm. the threat part so mm -hmm. far. And they seem to be now incorporating this idea and Avi Loeb suggested it. And here's how it works. Oh, a Muamua came into this system and it was actually an alien probe and it's AI and we need to get our AI up to snuff so it can communicate and give us all these wonderful, you know, this knowledge <laughs> about our planet. <laughs> 
<laughs> and, uh, you know, Loeb, while he's doing all this, he's like, we have to take a scientific approach. So he creates the Galileo Project, which is mm -hmm. started in June. Mm -hmm. And the two people he just recruited into it, though, were Elizondo, CIA man, and Chris Mellon, again, W's defense, you know, intelligence coordinator guy, mm -hmm. Iraq war and all that junk. Mm -hmm. So uh, the same faces just rearranged now around a scientific board. And now we have him sitting down with the director of national intelligence and Bezos and being like, hey, you know, we're going to these aliens are there and, you know, uh, we're going to communicate with them the same way, you know, we need to get up to snuff on AI is the same way like our kids now are good at tech and like the older people aren't so good at tech. And that's the same position that we're in with AI. So we get our AI up to snuff and it'll communicate with these aliens and Amua Amua and everybody will live happily ever after. <laughs> <laughs> so as, as, the orchestra play, as the orchestra plays nearer, my God, to thee and you're rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. <laughs> 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 Where are they going, Joseph, with the, ah. with the UFO narrative? They've they've tried to take it over now. That it's mm -hmm. you know it's out of the domain of the UFO researchers, many of which uh, got confused by the TTSA thing, apparently. And now the mainstream media they want to own this whole thing, and the CIA wants to run it. Where mm -hmm. are they going with this? I think they're prepping a narrative, and I think they are prepping the threat narrative. Yeah. And the reason that they're doing so, you know, Carol Rosen said it is so that they can weaponize space. Yeah. Uh, now, what that raises the question, are they really dealing with real ETs or are they just faking it? Mm -hmm. And I'm about 50 50 on that. Because if you've got exotic technology to begin with, you can easily fake that sort of thing. And I'm going back to uh, saucers, swastikas, and psyops with Otto Scorsini. Right. And his, you know, his report that I've just seen something remarkable in terms of some sort of exotic technology. He never specifies what it is. Magda Goebbels, Goebbels' wife, Dr. Goebbels' wife, even talks about this in her diary. And he comes up with this idea, well, let's use this exotic technology for, for psychological warfare. Right. So, you know, it could be that scenario. But then again, they could genuinely be afraid. Uh, that they are dealing with something like that that is imminent, and they're trying to get ahead of that narrative too. It's it's one of the two. It's one of the two. That's really interesting. The fear aspect is interesting to me because, of course, they always do exaggerated things when they're afraid. Yep. Uh, SDI Star Wars Iran Contra. Mm -hmm. There's a fear thing going on mm -hmm. in the middle of that, um, and we found out later through Gorbachev, Gorbachev mm -hmm. came up a couple of times today, that this is something the Reagan White House was afraid of, mm -hmm. which is they thought a UFO invasion is, is imminent and they wanted to throw in with the Russians on it. Well, let's remember Gorbachev's response was an unhesitating, of course, will help. Yes. He, he didn't hesitate. It was right, bang. You know, right. He didn't have to stop and think about it. And what that tells me is, well, the Soviets were afraid. And if you look at, Daniel, you mentioned the fear factor, and I think you're absolutely spot on here, because if you look at the the whole um, COVID narrative, the Great Reset narrative, and so on, these people are in a hurry. Yeah. And they're acting afraid of something. Yes. And they're making egregious mistakes Yeah. because of it. Because they are in a hurry and they are afraid. They're making some egregious mistakes. Their narrative is collapsing around them. No one trusts them. Mm -hmm. And for good reason, no one trusts them. Exactly. So they are, you know, if they are facing that kind of threat, the only thing that's going to save their butts, as far as I'm concerned, is a real honest transparency about whatever it is that they're dealing with. Yeah, uh, you know they've tried every narrative in the book: climate change, global warming. All of this stuff is collapsing, and the one thing that isn't collapsing is is the UFO problem. Right. And they're still trying. You know, now all of a sudden, after seventy years of one narrative, we're getting the complete opposite. Tell me that that's going to in ensure or engender trust. <laughs> exactly. This is the problem. Uh, you know because. They're not trustworthy to start with right. around this. They've they've lied. They've it's killed funny. a president. I mean, come yeah, right. on. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs>
<laughs> yeah, let's get into and a the... lot of his family. <laughs> yes, exactly. And they kept the records hidden for 58 years on yeah. that one. Yeah. Thank you for transparency, Mark. I mean, I made the point that uh, even in, you know, when Khrushchev took over Russia, he was like, yeah, Stalin did some bad things. Let's take some of those statues down, you know. These guys will not take their own sacred cows and be like, okay, Dulles organized a plan to kill President Kennedy, and it involved all these Wall Street forces mm -hmm. and all the rest, and he used these CIA people to do it. You know, mm -hmm. Do that and clear the record. Well, it's not going to happen with these people because right. you know they're up to their necks in it. But it is interesting to me, and I'll go back to that Napolitano quote, because what could be in there that would make Trump afraid to reveal those records? It would have to be something beyond just the, hey, the CIA participated in this, because right. everyone sort of knows that. Right. Um, so the UFO file comes up again, and then the director of national intelligence now, um, she's coming forward. We had James Woolsey, who was Clinton's mm -hmm. uh, former CIA director, and suddenly, you know what, Joseph, he wants to talk about UFOs too. Mm -hmm. And he has a story about his friend who got, you know, his plane got stuck because a UFO went by, you know, mm -hmm. he's got all kinds of stuff. <laughs> um, so, you know, we're obviously looking at a situation where all the intelligence people want to rush to the front. Mm -hmm. And what's amazing is in the case of Brennan, he's like, the government shouldn't withhold that. He was the CIA director. He knows right. the whole thing. He could easily right. let it out himself. Um, so that's a completely uh, sort of, that's a facade going on there about we need transparency. So the question is, if they want to assign everything to the UFOs as alien now, they're finally willing to come out of the box and say, we're under an alien threat. Uh, the op there is on the threat side. Right. They also can operate with, uh, hey, AI is here to save us from the evil aliens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they, they're, they're set low. They're setting things up so that they can play this or spin it any way they wish. The right. only problem that they really have is if they really are dealing with E.T., E.T. may not like to go along with the narrative, whatever they choose. <laughs> uh, that's the big problem. Oh, yeah. Um, that... That, to me, is why they're spinning the threat narrative, because, you know, way back years ago when we did the Bastard Secret Space Program conference, I pointed out that if you are the national security establishment in the late 40s, early 50s, and you're dealing with this UFO phenomenon, you either have to capitulate or you have to set up a program where you're going to emulate the performance characteristics of UFOs and demonstrate a capability, and this is the key part here, demonstrate a capability to engineer systems on a planner, if not stellar, scale. Right. Because if you can do that, then you're demonstrating that you've got a capability to make life awfully complicated for whoever it is that may be a threat to us. Okay. And, and that's what I think is going on here. They, they are ginning up the threat narrative so that they can roll out some of this stuff. They're ginning up the Great Reset, Social Credit, you know, Digital Society, Surveillance Society, because they need the planet locked down to deal with whatever it is out there that they think they're dealing with. Yeah. Or they're, or they're going to fake it. See, the fake narrative plays into that scenario just as easily. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if we fake an alien invasion, then we can, then we can get away with, uh, you know, imposing global martial law and mm -hmm. a global surveillance system. So they're pushing this narrative because I think if you look back, Daniel, I don't know if you're familiar with a, a document, a hoaxed document, incidentally called report from iron mountain. Yes. Have you ever read that? Yes. Well, in the report for iron mountain, supposedly it's a group of, of, you know, the global elite getting together to figure out how they can rule the world. What sort of, what sort of scheme can we come up with? And that, that report lists the environment, geophysical change and ET. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the environment narrative seems to be pretty much fizzling. I mean, they keep trotting it out, but it never gets anywhere. Exactly. And that leaves basically geophysical change, which means you've, you've got, systems of the planetary scale that you can engineer that sort of stuff. Think Fukushima, 
think the convenient Haiti earthquake, you know, all sorts of stuff. Oh, yeah. Or the Indonesian tsunami, as Catherine Fitz has pointed out. Uh, and then you've got E.T. Mm -hmm. And here we are. <laughs> You're right. That's really interesting. We know there was a real report. Right. I always thought the Iron Mountain thing is strange because. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, it does actually let out a lot. Oh, yeah. Um, but we know that the Brookings Institute looked at this in 62, 63 and said, oh, you know, we can't release any information. It would impact society badly right. if they knew about the whole ET thing. And we know they looked at it in the 80s under Reagan. Um, what's interesting to me is it seems like they got to a point with the technology on their end where they're comfortable um, saying that on their side that they could stage an incident. Right. And that right. gets into Von Braun's prediction, which I think is relevant. Yes. Um, because so far, the stages that he's talked about have all come true. Yep. In exactly the order. In exactly the order. Mm -hmm. And the final one was alien threat. Yeah. And that we need to weaponize space as a result of that. And then the caveat at the end was it's all a lie. Mm hmm so um, that brings us back to the alien thing, because actual UFOs and the things that we've seen and the reports that we've had, you made a very interesting observation, which was that the UFOs themselves, if they're studying them, uh, don't exhibit a signature, a physics signature outside of this solar system. Right. Right. There's, there's, there's only one instance that I can think of where you have a physics signature that is suggestive of uh, an interstellar capability, and that's those strange uh, space shuttle videos where you see these circular things kind of spinning, and they pop into view, and, they slow, and they've got a hole in the middle of them, and, right. a, little, and a little notch on the outside of the rim of the, yes. these things. Well, they sort of pop, in, pop into view. And to me, that's either a signature of something popping in from hyperspace, so to speak, right. you know, all of the Hollywood uh, CGI, yeah. or it's a signature of a stealth technology that's being turned off. It's one of the two. Mm -hmm. So there's that one case. I think things are open, but in no other case have I seen, you know, this is, this is my problem with, with UFO reports. I look at the physics signatures. Are we seeing signatures sufficient, compulsive and sufficient to indicate that these are traveling here from another star system? I'm sorry. I don't see it. Interesting. So, so if they're in the system, if they're in this system, right. Uh, this is interesting because where do you, th I mean, obviously there's lots of uh, UFO activity on earth and mm -hmm. outside of earth, but where in this system do you think that activity is coming from? Saturn. Saturn. Chronos. Why Saturn? Chronos. Yeah. Gigantomachy. Yes. The war of the gods. Norman, right. Norman Bergman, or Bergman, um, you know the ring makers of Saturn and all of that stuff. You look at you look at uh, just the the moon of Saturn, Iapetus. You know my question has always been, what did George Lucas know and when did he know it? Yeah, right. Because you look at that <laughs> you look at that moon and it looks like the Death Star. It does. It it you know there's no there's no two ways about it. It does. It's remarkable. It is remarkable, and it, you know the odd thing is it's got those straight edges. If you look at those pictures, mm -hmm. it's not round. Right. <laughs> it's straight edges. What, are the, what is the problem here? Yeah, what's the problem there, folks? <laughs> you know, when was the last time you looked at a planet's limb and saw straight edges? <laughs> <laughs> That's a problem. Um, you know, there's there's all sorts of strange stuff. There's that asteroid that Hoagland pointed out many years ago that the European Space Agency decided it wanted to go photograph, and it looks like a diamond. It looks like a magna cut diamond. Yes. You know, on and on we could go. So it's it's coming from inside the system, and if you look at the anomalies of the planet and the moons of Saturn and compare those to the ancient texts, mm -hmm. you know, the, the whole Greek gigantomachy, 
is started by Kronos. That's the name of Saturn in the Greek mythology. So what's going on here? I don't right. know. Interesting. Um, that is really fascinating. <laughs> I will say for Berggren's sake, when he did come out uh, and talk about his book from the 80s, which is remarkable uh, that he had this information, he stuck completely to all the original details. And he said, well, they briefed President Reagan on that. Mm -hmm. So Reagan was hearing about gigantic ships mm -hmm. refueling there mm -hmm. in the rings of Saturn. Um, that would be enough for him to say, let's get Gorbachev at Reykjavik immediately. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's, let's talk to Mikhail right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Wow. Uh, I've got, I have a couple more questions for you, and then we're going to take questions sure. from everyone. How's it going out there? Great. I have too many questions already. <laughs> Okay. Uh, we'll make sure to get you out of here on time, however. And uh, it's great to have Dr. Farrell with us. This uh, episode and us doing it live is, is great to have everyone here because the two videos that we did on Mars uh, <laughs> both got taken down unceremoniously. And uh, the explanation, as I said at the beginning of the program. You're was... an impersonator, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> Impersonating a historical event. Event. <laughs> okay. Please let us know what it is. <laughs> I'd like to know which one. So we can stop offending the system. Yeah, so we can stop offending <laughs> with our brazen impersonation. <laughs> um, and I do want to mention that that book you mentioned, uh, Sosters, Swasticas, and Psyops, that's your mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's a very interesting. I, I want to make mention of the fact that um, you have a series of books there from 2014, 2013, mm -hmm. 2015, which presage so much of the UFO stuff coming out. And it really is remarkable to go back and read those books because it's so much of the things that we're hearing about now, and it's all laid in there. So you had incredible insights uh, going into this. Now. Um, the thing I want to find out about where the national security state is at on this is if they're coming forward and doing their own UFO events in Washington, D.C., and the representatives are the Amazon guy and the director of national intelligence and Avi Loeb over here at Harvard, who I know you'd love to have coffee with sometime. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, what stage are they at? with this, if they're developing this threat narrative, they're still measuring, will it be accepted, let's say. Yeah. And uh, they've seen, they've got a lot of data from the lockdowns and everything else that suggest, okay, here, here's points, pockets of resistance, here's things that we did that worked, and here are things that didn't work. But now the media every other day is promoting some, you know, that every, every commercial has an alien theme to it. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I found really fascinating, and I mentioned it on the show last night, it's, it's an area of steganography I'm following, but I want your input on this. And it has to do with President Biden, and I use the term extremely loosely. I always um, put an asterisk behind President when I mention him. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do the Biden Yanko, which I really like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's more like it. But, um, Joseph, he keeps talking about Satchel Page, and um, <laughs> Satchel Page is, uh, you know, a uh, baseball player that was in the Negro League mm -hmm. in the 40s and had a great record. Mm -hmm. But um, his, him saying this is telegraphed all over the world because they're saying, oh, he, he misspoke. He used this word that's not used anymore and all the rest. Um, but when meeting with Francis, our good friend Francis, oh, uh, he wants to talk to him about Satchel Page. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that bothered me about all that was that, um, you know, I looked into it and found out that there was this Mars rover named Spirit. Mm -hmm. And from 2006 to 2010, they had a number of discoveries. One of them was called the Baseball Diamond there. And they started naming all the aspects out of members of that uh, Negro Baseball League. Mm -hmm. So one of them uh, in that list was Satchel Page. Mm -hmm. So uh, the points of connections in steganography here with him going around talking about Satchel Page with the Pope would be, we found ancient ruins on Mars, and now everybody in this kind of 
field has to get ready for it. They've been getting ready for it for a long time. The Pope himself made mention of Martians. Um, it seems like the Satchel Page reference is a setup again to this Mars piece. And you pointed out that the Mars piece relates to ancient technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the question is, how do you roll that narrative out? And are, is the aspect there then to change the human origin story and rearrange religion and spiritual beliefs on the planet? Well, I think that's part of it. Uh, they've, they've been trying to do that a long time. I got bad news for them. It's not going to work, but, um, <laughs> but I, I do think that's a part of it. I think, I think in terms of a stage that they're at now with this, mm -hmm is I do think they're prepping a narrative. And I, I do think, and I, I totally agree with your observation that you made earlier, that it looks to me like they're in the measurement stage. They're, they're still calibrating the social engineering aspects of this to see how many people are going to pick up on it and go with it. There's a big problem that they have. And that is, my impression is that they are not convincing uh, a certain segment of, of the ufology community with all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. I think there's too many people that, that have woken up that are looking at uh, everything the government does with a suspicion that, that it's some sort of manipulation. Right. So where, where they're going to go with it, I don't know. I don't think in one respect that they're ever going to come clean, and that's the archaeological warfare aspect of the story. Right. Um, that that would require admitting too much about what they're up to, which I do think they're up to that. That they are they are looking for that ancient technology, absolutely, um, and they want to get their hands on it. That there's behind my way of viewing it, Daniel, is behind all of this narrative about taking Dixie cups and going and scooping up asteroids and all of this stuff. They're telling us that they're looking for something and they're going to do it under the guise of commercializing space. And here's the important point. This is going to be done by corporations. Anything corporations find out there by way of technology will be proprietary. Mm -hmm. This was the problem. This is the problem. Yeah, this is the problem. This is the problem that goes back to Eisenhower. Yep. Yeah. And Eisenhower thinking, in the case of continuity of government, if we do get nuked, it'll be good that not just the military has this, that it'll be good for the corporations to have it. Right. But what happened was that process got abused yep. in the aerospace companies and the defense contractors. They yep. have too much of the tech themselves. Yep. Yep. Um, you've they talked will. about how the NASA... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, they will be able to keep it completely quiet. Right. So in other words, whatever policy the government does is not going to affect their own decisions about whether or not they're going to release any of this technology. I really think that the push for, for the surveillance society is because of the existence of this technology. Because you've got a proliferation problem with it. The technology, if you, if you know a little bit of basic you know, electrical physics, you can do it in a garage if you want to. And I'm exaggerating, but you, you take my point. Um, that's that's a real proliferation problem. They had it with Tesla a right. you know, hundred years ago. Yes. So they had they had no way of surveillance. Now they've got they've got the means to do it. So that's the other thing that I think uh, bodes for rolling out this technology is once they get their grid in place, which again, I don't think they'll be able to do. But in their thinking, once they get their, their surveillance grid into place, they think they can safely roll this stuff out. Um, and again, you know, if there are real ETs out there, they may not, not want us to roll us this stuff out. You know, cosmic war again. Yeah. Uh, you know, don't don't build any more big cannons, Germany. Um, oh, look, we found some old blueprints, you know, 20 years later. But, you know, that, <laughs> you know, that didn't work and it's, it's probably not going to work again. So it's they're in a mess They They have put they have boxed themselves into into a real difficult situation with all their secrecy.
And I think, you know, going back to Kennedy, I think Kennedy saw it and yeah. saw that it wasn't the way forward. Right. Um, he had a number of speeches trying to get rid of that secrecy. Yep. Peace. Uh, realizing that ultimately it undercuts the culture. If you have one yep. part of it going one way and the other part moving along, there's going to be too much of a schizophrenic yep. relationship from the top to the bottom. Yep. And um, it's interesting, actually, because when I think of what they're doing around the UFO file, now we have, um, you know, this pops into my mind immediately, which is April Haynes, who's the director of national intelligence that we talked about, who did this big event yesterday. Well, her specialty is theoretical physics. Uh -huh. That's an odd thing for an intelligence uh, honcho. Yeah. That's that's a Joseph Farrell kind of odd thing. It's kind of it's kind of an Angela Merkel Chancellor of Germany doctor in quantum chemistry type of thing. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, really, Angela? You did that too, did you? <laughs> um, hey, she doesn't have to be Hitler's daughter. That's she doesn't daughter. have to be Hitler's daughter. <laughs> she knows exactly what CERN is up to. You know. <laughs> And she's helping fund it, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I find this interesting. Um, so the theoretical physics signature is around, and suddenly uh, Gillibrand, uh, I should mention this, which is something we've discussed, which is Senator Curzon Gillibrand out of New York, the one who got appointed there uh, when Hillary went off to become Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. bomb the hell out of Libya. Uh, she, uh, Gillibrand now is coming out and she's a UFO crusader. You know, mm -hmm. if you can't get that UFO thing going, you know, you don't have any dignity. And, you know, she really is just, she's been appointed. There's a Democrat. Um, I, I pointed out the Democrat from Arizona earlier who uh, is a congressman and suddenly, you know, the UAP train is there with him, mm -hmm. Galeo. Mm -hmm. So they have all these Democrats coming together and the Republican side, they've got Rubio, right? You know, who was running the UAP task force. But they're going into this big uh, push going on. And she just announced in her, um, you know, congressional record, she read it into the record that she wants an amendment to this year's NDAA. And she wants this new department, ASRO, uh, to study anomalies. And, um, you know, that this is the whole UFO thing. They want it institutionalized on the inside mm -hmm. and, you know, oh, they're going to take it seriously. The only problem is, you know, they're all Democrats and uh, except for Rubio. And then collectively, uh, they all seem all of a sudden to be playing right into this UAP narrative out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, so we have that going on. We have this big conference and then we have Bill Nelson who you blogged about just recently, the head of NASA, and suddenly he wants to talk about ET, but he talked about something else too. Remind me. Non-state actors. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, they, the fact that they're willing to admit that to me is another interesting dot to connect and the reason I think it's so interesting is because it was another Democrat, Secretary of Defense under President Clinton, William Cohen, that also talked about non-lethal weapons. Remember that? Yes. And what did he say? Well, our biggest concern is that these things are getting into the hands of non-state actors. Right. Like that weird cult in Japan. And he yes. specifically mentioned that. Yeah. Um. So that's, to me, an acknowledgement that at least a part of the deep state is finally admitting that there's an actor on the stage here on this planet that they have not reckoned on before. Right. And Or at least they haven't admitted. Now, I think they've known about it for a very long time. They, they were in bed with it. So that, to me, is another little telltale clue that this could go blow up in their faces that non-state actor or actors may not want to play along with their narrative or then again they may uh -huh. the other the other odd thing here is let's go all the way back to the brookings institute 
I find it very odd that the Brookings Institute mentioned religion as one of the primary problems that they would have in making any disclosure. And of course, again, I think they totally misread the situation. But I think the misreading is to a purpose, namely that they intend to use all of this stuff, as you've said, to reinterpret human history That's right. and reconfigure you know, the world religions and so on and so forth. Right. Now, you know, the you, ETs and all this stuff are not going to make one whit of a difference to Islam or Christianity or Judaism or Buddhism because they've been talking about this stuff for centuries. You know? Right, yeah. <laughs> Come on, guys, get with the program here. But, <laughs> but the other thing that the Brookings Report mentions that I think is extremely interesting is that they were also concerned equally not just with the possibility of contacting E.T., but stumbling across their remains and artifacts. Oh. It's right there in the Brookings report. Plain as day. That is really interesting. Yeah, it's right there. And they, they mention it in the context, which I find even weirder still, in the context of exotic things like electrohydrodynamic drives, you know, that's their term for it. That's not me. That's the Brookings Institute. Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, what the heck is an electrohydrodynamic drive? Could it be things like electrogravitics, ionic propulsion? Who knows? Mm -hmm. But they had something in their noggins that they were thinking about in the same breath that they were worried about religion and stumbling across extraterrestrial artifacts. <laughs> Remarkable. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's really bizarre. Wow. That is a great catch. Oh Absolutely. yeah. I put, I, it in, I put it in uh covert wars or breakaway civilizations or class. One of, one of the two covert wars books, but it's yeah. there. It's yeah. There. Um, that really makes me think because let's talk about an ancient state act. <laughs> Okay. Uh, there's a, I'm going to go into some Casey stuff here for a second. There's mm -hmm. a Casey reading when they're asking him, um, you know, the Atlanteans, he describes these power stations and flying machines, and he's talking all about these things that can fly through things. Uh -huh. um, I remember that. Yeah. It's pretty interesting physics. Of yeah. Yeah. <laughs> At one point, they say, um, well, what would this stuff be comparable to? And, he, you know, what were exactly were they like? And he said, well, they were like the ships that Ezekiel described, but at a much later date. Mm -hmm. um, in the Bible, Ezekiel describes that incredible yeah, ship. The wheels and, with it, yeah. Yes, the wheel within the wheel and the faces and everything. Um but the interesting thing is, of course, Atlantis had long passed, and so somebody still had access to this, according to Casey, looking at the record there, mm -hmm. uh, the Akashic record. Who's got that? Who is maintaining Atlantean technology in that period to show it to Ezekiel many years later? And again, Ezekiel, you know, they portray him as the shepherd <laughs> and all this kind of stuff, but he... When he speaks, he speaks almost like a scientific, you know, a science mm -hmm. major, like mm -hmm. he's, he's giving a lecture on it. Mm -hmm. So he's also describing something. Um, what is it between Enoch and Ezekiel and this Casey looking out and saying, oh, the Atlantean technology is like the stuff that they're describing, but that's a mm -hmm. much later day. Somebody has it. Somebody either has it or hid it. I don't know who it would be, however. Um I've always maintained a suspicion, and it's purely speculative. I have no hard evidence for this. But if you look at the Renaissance, and particularly at Cosimo de Medici in Florence, Cosimo de Medici is the one that found a copy of the Greek text of the Hermetica. Hmm. Uh, he had been searching for it. He actually found it <clears throat> and later, <clears throat> pardon me, had Ficino stop all of his translations of Plato and translate the Hermetica. That's why we have the text now. Cosimo de Medici. Wow, yeah. remarkable. Yeah. And Medici used all of his intelligence and financial connections to find it. He eventually bought a copy from from some people in Byzantium that, that had it. 
And what this tells me is, number one, Medici knew something ahead of time <clears throat> to go looking for it. And the fact that he was able to find it and then insist that it be translated and publicized at a time when people thought that the Hermetica represented an ancient uh, primordial wisdom from Egypt. Right. So the, what I'm getting at here is while the technology didn't survive, the concepts behind it did. Mm -hmm. And right. this is this is what Medici's glomming on to. And after that, then you have a very interesting statement in Paracelsus, uh, Theophrastus, Bombastus, Philip von Hohenheim to give to give him his or her. It may have been a, <laughs> it may have been a her. You know, that's the other. Thank you. Remember that name right off the bat, though. That's remarkable. <laughs> well, well, how can you miss a name like that? <laughs> but. but Paracelsus says something very interesting in his writings about esoterica. He says that if you look at the ancient Hebrews, if you look at the ancient body of wisdom, it became fragmented into three parts. The Egyptians got the component dealing with mat, or what we would probably call now the, the energy of the medium. The Babylonians got astrology, and the Hebrews got Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on to say, with that fragmentation of what used to be a whole, if you look at the wanderings of the Hebrews, they are in Egypt, then they go to Palestine, then they get whisked off to Mesopotamia after the fall of Jerusalem, and then they come back after Cyrus the Great releases them. And he says, if you look at it a certain way, it looks almost as if someone is using the Hebrews to try and put all of that fragmented system oh, back yeah. together. Interesting. So this is the way they're thinking about all of this during the Renaissance. And the most interesting thing about all of this is a scholar by the name of Isaac Kosoban, I talk about this in Thrice Great Hermetica, came along, an English scholar, and did an etymological study of the Hermetica and concluded that these texts do not date from any Egyptian period. They are post-Christian texts right around the second to the third century. Okay. So the whole uh, bag, the whole bag of air inside the Renaissance humanist esoteric occult movement just sort of collapsed. Mm -hmm. But then in the 20th century, an Oxford scholar went back to look at Kosoban's case and said, you, you cannot treat the ancient idea of authorship the same way because authors will ascribe things to a precursor on the basis of a resemblance of concepts. And if you look at the concepts in the Hermetica, they are very clearly Egyptian. Right. They're just they're just Hellenized or Greekified, if you will. So again, the argument has flipped once again, you know, mm -hmm. totally completely flipped from what it was in the in the post-Renaissance period. So I think you have to look at these people like Raymond Lull and Cosimo de Medici and Paracelsus and all of these people during the Middle Ages that are dabbling in these alchemical texts and these hermetic texts because they sense there's a technology behind right. these concepts. Yes. That's how you explain alchemy. And alchemy itself, you know, I wrote The Philosopher's Stone, and I've pointed out what most people don't want to acknowledge about alchemy, and that is if there were so many failures over such a period of time, why did humans keep researching it? Yeah. Yeah. And then you get those little odd statements that every now and then somebody may have actually pulled it off. Yes. You know, so uh, the key point here being you read in alchemical texts about putrefying dung, you know, some of the stuff that they were trying to 
used to create gold out of base metals. You read these strange references to putrefying dung. And then along comes that little bacterium that they discovered circa 2010 that eats a bunch of stuff and poops out gold. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe they were onto something. <laughs> they had that in the 14th century. And they had right. that in the 14th century. <laughs> so here we go. Well, you know, this is interesting because uh, I'm reminded of the Moses story since you, you mentioned Hebrews. And I think of the Exodus and I think of those 40 years wandering there in the desert. Mm -hmm. um, but they're getting manna from heaven from this kind of circular thing. <laughs> oh, I think I think that's I think it was monatomic gold. Yeah. Yes, this is what I wanted to ask you about. Yeah, I think it was monatomic gold because you have these strange Egyptian references to something called it, it, it's literally misfit. You know, it's M M N P F Z T. You know, you're right. <laughs> uh, fill in your own vowels. Um, but, <laughs> but clearly, you know, Lawrence Gardner pointed out that there's a place right across, uh, uh, right where it would be opposite the Suez Canal today. Of course, it didn't exist back then, but there was this place where there's some sort of big smelter or foundry where the Egyptians were literally making gold or burning gold, which is, you know, an extremely high heat. So that's what I think this was, you know. Um, there's there's lots of there's lots of alchemy going on in some of those passages when you read them, if you read them with those kind of, of lenses. So again, you know, somebody's preserving this knowledge somewhere. Well, it's interesting because I've done a lot of research recently on Andrew Carnegie, mm -hmm. and uh, his absolute obsession with Egyptian ruins is one thing, but the real obsession is dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. And he has to have his people, as soon as there's anything anywhere in the world, his team goes out and they lay claim to it and all the rest. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems like he's engaged in a quest like this to find mm -hmm. something that's going on back there. And, um, you know, the official story that we have related to dinosaurs 65 million years ago, this all disappeared. There's a weird thing, again, going back to Casey now, he's talking... And they say, uh, you know, describe something about the Atlantean, something important about a particular era they were in. And he said, well, in 50,722 BC, they had to all get together with all the scientists, like a worldwide broadcast, to deal with the dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and he also suggests there that it was their own meddling that had created them. <laughs> <laughs> So like a Jurassic Park circa 50,000 BC. Think Tiamat in the, en <laughs> in the Enuma Elish. Yes. Uh -huh. The Scorpion uh -huh. Men. Uh -huh. um, yeah. What does, you know, what is the obsession that somebody like Carnegie has with Egyptian ruins and dinosaurs? Is that the thing that you think they're looking for? I think, again, I think they're looking for signs of a technology and, and the use and application of it. And in Carnegie's case, Carnegie was a rough contemporary of the German archaeologist Koldewey. And I've mentioned Koldewey in Genes, Giants, Monsters, and Men. He's that strange German archaeologist that was looking at the Ishtar Gate in Babylon, helped recover the Ishtar Gate. The reason it's in Berlin is because of Koldewey. And if you look at the Ishtar Gate, well, you've got a cow and you've got a bird, and then you've got this weird thing <laughs> <laughs> in the middle called a syrish. Uh -huh. Remember that? And yes. This, this thing has the four feet of a panther or some big cat, the hind legs of some big bird, a tail like a scorpion, and a head that's kind of a mix between a dragon and a cat. It's like a chimera. It, it's like a chimera. Yeah. And Koldavai's problem was what are the Babylonians doing putting this thing on a freeze with animals that actually exist? Yeah. The context here is all wrong. And then he gets into the texts and discovers that the Babylonians were keeping a couple of these things around in their zoos. <laughs> <Get right. laughs> you know? so, wow. world, so World War I is going on, and 
Koldavai says, well, I might as well come clean. So he publishes his findings that he thinks this was a real existent creature in 1918, you know, that's the height of the wars going on. So nobody really noticed what he'd done until long, <laughs> until long after the war was over and they actually read him. But yeah, you know, this, this type of stuff is going on and Carnegie, you know, he's going to eat up anything like that. Right. He's going to absolutely eat anything like that up. So I think, I think again, you've got a bunch of people looking for something. They know there's something wrong with, with the quackademic history of things, and, and they're trying to find out what it is. They're going to um, keep it in the loop of just yep. a small group of people yep. who are in the know on this, and they have the kind of uh, weight and power of the Carnegie Foundation right. types. Rockefellers did it later. They used yep. people like Sitchin. Yep. for example, yep. in the same way. Um, and the Smithsonian is another incredible example of this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> Fascinating. Did you, did you know that my Uncle Bob, during his career in government, was the budget director for the Smithsonian? No. Dr. Oh. Robert, Dr. Robert Lee Farrell. Yep. Fascinating. Yep. And did you learn some things there? No. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> I haven't I haven't seen my uncle Bob in about 20 years. Uh -huh. And at, at the time it didn't it didn't occur to me to ask him. Sure. But uh I'm sure that probably there's something he could tell me. I, I do remember as a kid touring the Smithsonian when he had just got the job and he took us around and showed us a bunch of stuff that most people don't get to see and it was it was quite fascinating. They had a lot of stuff. Wow. A lot of stuff. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. remarkable um and I'm glad you mentioned genes, giants, and monsters because um, you do a very interesting take on the giant aspect and how it was covered up. Mm -hmm. um, and it does suggest very early, early scientific manipulation oh, yeah. around these things. There are references in the Bible that sound like it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The, um, the bed of Og, the king of Bashan, if you if you take the biblical measurements, this guy was huge. Yeah, I mean, you know, huge. And you you compare that those biblical references to these Babylonian cylinder seals, where you've got these little tiny people bringing gifts or something to this big huge guy sitting on a throne. And yes. right, you know, <laughs> I've seen some of those. Yeah, if you look at it, it's like either you have an incredible ego, or there's there's a problem here. There's there's this is either metaphor or it isn't. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's, there's so, only two ways about it. And you know, the the uh, Babylonian term for king, um, uh, I forget Lugal. Oh, what's the name for king? I, the, the word escapes me now, but. The, the word for king literally means big man. Yes. The giants. The giant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there's two pieces back there which they've never shared with us. Uh, the giants and these elongated heads. Yes. Uh, because yep. that you see throughout these different cultures and you're like, what mm -hmm. are they? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. And then we know there are primitive attempts to try to recreate them mm -hmm. in cultures, but who were they to start with? And yeah. why do we have Akhenaten and Nefertiti and they have it displayed? Not like other pharaohs, you mm -hmm. know, other pharaohs have, you know, that kind of brave looking, I'm on my chariot <laughs> throwing an arrow. Uh, with this thing, you know, they, they want to portray them with the very, very long heads and then they yes. have the very strange hats on top of that. Yes, yes, yeah. And again, we may be looking at kind of a cargo cult phenomenon where they're just imitating something that they've seen, right? You know, which makes sense to me. Uh, it makes more it makes more sense than the standard quackademic explanations. Let's put it that way. There's no question about it, and we can see that that stuff. You know, as we go along, right after they found Gobekli Tepe, and they said, "Well, look, this is twelve thousand years old." That blew away all of the arguments that everyone had, um, and you know, we have to give people like. Steiner and Casey and all those people credit. They said, no, this goes back a long time ago. Long time. You know? And the pyramids are 10,000 BC in Casey's arc. But, you know, in your Giza Death Star books, they go back a lot further than that. Yeah, yeah I think um, so. One I of think the interesting so. things uh, mentioning the Casey stuff is when he talks about the Giza Plateau, he says, oh, yeah, when they were scoping this out in 10,500 BC, they were doing archaeology. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, and, and actually, actually, if you read the the Edfu temple texts in Egypt, they will say the same thing. Interesting. If, if you're familiar with those texts, yes, yeah, they um, they will say essentially the same thing. Joseph, the dating for ancient Egypt as a sophisticated culture, where does it actually go? Where would you place? It? I think I think Egypt is much older. Mm -hmm. than than standard academic Egyptology says. I think there's a good possibility that that you're looking at something that may go back twenty thousand years. Yeah. I really Absolutely. Do. Um, the other piece, it seems like those cultures that picked up on it, uh, the Sumerians, Mesopotamia, the Egyptians, is about the planet that is destroyed and then becomes the asteroid belt. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, they even give it a name, mm -hmm. but um, what is the function of that piece in your own work in the Giza Death Star book? Well, the exploded planet. Yes. Uh, I think that that planet, the, the basic function is that that planet was deliberately blown up in a war. Yeah. And again, if you if you look at uh, the Enuma Elish, Tiamat is the name of a planet, and Tiamat is destroyed. If right. you read the fourth tablet of the Enuma Elish, it's, it recounts the destruction of Tiamat, and it's a very odd, it's a very odd description, because it says essentially that Marduk blew wind into Tiamat, okay, repeatedly, and then took his spear and burst it. So if you if you read that from kind of a physics point of view you're loading energy into a, an object, or in this case, a planet, that it cannot damp, and then you hit it with one final pulse, and kablooey, it, it blows up. Wow. So I think I think Tiamat is basically that planet that was blown up. And the 19th century astronomers, that when they discovered the asteroid belt and hypothesized, well, a planet blew up. You know what they named it? No. Yeah. Krypton. Interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> that is really fascinating, and um, we've never been given a good explanation for the asteroid belt. Never, never. It doesn't exist. <laughs> the only one, the only one who who revived that exploded planet hypothesis was Dr. Tom Van Flandern. And, you know, I put this in my book, The Cosmic War. When you read Van Flandern trying to figure out a possible model or mechanism for what happened to the planet, well, the first thing he says, well, maybe there was, and no, you lay down, maybe there was an <laughs> unstable uh, fission reactor in the center of the planet that went critical and blew it up. But he's not satisfied with that for good reason. So his next model is, well, maybe there was a bunch of antimatter in the core of the planet under some sort of containment, and the containment broke down, and kablooey, the planet blew up. Wow. And again, he's not satisfied with that for good reason. And so the final thing that he says is, or it could have been the result of some deliberate action. Oh, that's oh, it. That's it. Yeah. And that's the last thing he mentions. And he doesn't elaborate on it, but it's the one that makes the most sense when you compare them to the other two models. And again, you know, it, it fits the ancient texts mm -hmm. that this is what happened. So in other words, there's a technology around somewhere, folks, able yeah. to blow up planets. And we've got an odd thing around Saturn <laughs> <laughs> that looks oddly familiar, <laughs> you know. Um, so yeah, I, I think, you know, uh, George Lucas's galley galaxy a long time ago and far, far away is right here. Something that he was aware of yeah. somehow, yeah. um, which is Anakin, Anakin Skywalker, Anunnaki. Yes. Yes. The force, Mott in Egypt, mm -hmm. zero point energy, energy of the medium, on and on we could go. Right. So as far as I'm concerned, he's telling a mythology right about our own celestial neighborhood. It's really remarkable. Um, the last thing on Mars, and it relates to this, John Brandenburg, mm -hmm. uh, he was in the Secret Space Conference with us. Mm -hmm. He did remarkable 
lectures in a book about a nuclear explosion on Mars. on Mars. He was convinced of it based on his research. And also, we both noted he was a government scientist, so he was allowed to come out and say these things, which is also kind of weird. <laughs> um, his conclusions about a nuclear signature on Mars, what do you think? Oh, I think they're absolutely true. Because what he's talking about is, is the high presence of, of the isotope xenon-129 in the Martian atmosphere. Xenon-129 is only produced in nuclear explosions, fission explosions. Now, Brandenburg is talking about a thermonuclear device, a fusion device of about 1,000 megatons, which <laughs> is, is enormous. But they are possible. You can build fusion bombs to any size you want. Mm -hmm. And certainly, if, if you're going to build them in the standard way of having an atom bomb set off the fusion bomb, uh, that atom bomb is going to produce a lot of, of xenon-129. So I'm, I, I think he's made a very solid case. Uh, he's, his uh, approach and his research is so unusual and doesn't seem to have any corollaries to it. I find that very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. It's, uh, just, it's just out there in isolation. Yes. It's when you plug it into all this other stuff, you have to, you have to sit up and take notice. Absolutely. Because, because that means somebody let off a really big bomb <laughs> <laughs> right. Just on the planet Mars. We'll take a couple of quick questions and then we'll let you go because I know we're right. keeping you. Okay. So since we only have time for a couple questions, yes. I'm going to start with a big one. Okay. Uh, Summer Forever wants to know, can we talk about the Antichrist? <laughs> <laughs> um, Antichrist. I've said this many times to whoever asked the question that the template that Mr. Globaloni is following, in my opinion, is a dispensationalist theological template that they are literally trying to put into place a, Catherine Fisk calls it a beast system, and I happen to agree with her. That's exactly what they're trying to put into place economically and financially. The problem is, and I hope you will hear me here and think about what I'm about to tell you very carefully. Dispensationalist theology requires the belief in its standard American versions that when Christ said it is finished, he really didn't mean it. It requires the belief at some point of in its usual American version of the restoration of Israel and of animal sacrifice as a means of uh, communion with God. This is a completely anti-Christian view because from the very beginning of the church, it is very clear that the teaching of the church is that the work of Christ finished all other systems of sacrifice and did so once and for all. So any restoration of that system or talk of doing so is from the standpoint of traditional biblical Christianity, heresy. The other problem is if you look at, I'm thinking of Clarence Larkin, for example, or Hal Lindsey, you know, the late great planet Earth. Oh, yeah. It's kind of a watered-down version of Clarence Larkin and his Bible maps of the ages. If you look at the way that that theology talks about the end time, you first have Antichrist setting himself up literally in a restored temple in Jerusalem and proclaiming himself as God and demanding everybody worship. Now, who does that sound like? And then Christ comes back, kicks the Antichrist out, <laughs> puts himself in the restored temple, proclaims himself as God, and rules with a rod of iron. Now, here's the problem I have. Other than the timeline, there is no difference of character between the two. Huh. And if your timeline just happens to be wrong, if you've misinterpreted all those Bible problems... Bible verses, you're in a whale of a problem. You're in a kind of deception. For me, the key thing here to remember is that 
the resurrection overthrows the kingdom of death. So the, the kingdom of Christ is not of this world, as he himself said, because that event breaks the law of karma once and for all. So it's got nothing to do with what's going on in the Middle East or any of this stuff. It's got everything to do with your own spiritual life and whether or not you are in virtue or not. That's the key. So any system that's diverting you to look at political events in this world, yes, they may be end-time fulfillments, but not in the way you suspect. The fulfillment is the deception. Hmm. So that's. I hope that makes some sense for whoever asked the question. Oh, it's yeah, question. an emphasis on uh, false prophecy. It's, it's an emphasis. It's an emphasis on a false interpretation of a real prophecy, mm -hmm. and that's the problem here. There are other interpretations out there, but I guarantee you, the dispensationalist interpretation, uh, whether it's premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial, any of those dispensationalist interpretations, are simply foreign to the vast majority of of the church fathers. They they simply don't talk about it. There's only one who does talk about it. And that's Irenaeus of Lyon. But the rest of them, it's, they just don't think in these terms at all. In fact, the book of Revelations itself is the only book of the Bible that is not read liturgically in the Orthodox Church. Oh, interesting. For a very, for a very interesting reason that I will talk about some other time. Anyway, I hope that, <laughs> I hope that, I hope that helps. Yeah, and since you mentioned that uh, this is actually a good piece, which is I wanted to ask you, um, John of Patmos, uh -huh. when he's seeing this incredible vision of Revelation, mm -hmm. and you mentioned the beast system and everything, mm -hmm. what is happening to him that he has this incredible vision? I think what you're dealing with in many cases is, and I'm going to sound a bit nutty here, I think you're dealing with a case of kind of, uh, of remote viewing precognition. Yeah. Um, because if you look at certain statements in, in the Gospels, you get kind of a retro causation. And this is, this is incidentally the way the church fathers think. Uh, when they look at statements of Christ claiming to be God, you know, I am that I am, or uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life, you know, all of these I ams. Well, every time he says I am, he's taking the name Yahweh on his lips. Mm. That's what Yahweh means, I am. And in one case in the Gospel of John, he uses the emphatic version in Greek. So in other words, in Greek, you can say I am simply by saying imi. But when you say ego imi, I am, you're emphasizing a claim. And he uses that language in the Gospel of St. John over and over again. And in one particular context, which is very interesting, he says, amen, amen, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Right. So in other words... The way the church fathers look at it is that Christ is making the claim to be Yahweh, not that other guy. Mm. You remember, he says, you are a liar and murderer. You are of your father, the devil. Yeah. And he was a liar and murderer from the beginning. Right. So they look at all of those Old Testament theophanies, you know, the burning bush and so on and so forth, as literally being Christ himself. And they will also say if you read certain church fathers, that when the Lord is walking with Adam and Eve in the garden, it's actually Christ incarnate that is walking with them. So yeah. there's a there's a retro causation that you're dealing with, and it's kind of time travel, if you will. And I think this is the phenomenon that's at work in, in a lot of these um, things like John of Patmos. Fascinating. Really you know, um, and I remember the reaction of the Pharisees when he says, you know, before Abraham was, I am. Uh -huh. They say, oh, you're not even 40 years old. Get out of here. What are you yeah. talking about? They pick up stones. <laughs> right. And, you know, they're ready to stone him to death. They're obviously not. <laughs> they're not happy <laughs> about that. That's <laughs> <laughs> so. Olivia. Um, Tricky Vicky, would Bezos and all these people be flying into space on a tour if they thought there were any threats up there? Um, no, 
But then again, they haven't flown very far into space. <laughs> My question is, is if they had the opportunity to say, go visit Saturn, <laughs> would, yeah, it might be different would, story. would they hop on that bus? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> no way. Uh uh. No, it's a good question. But again, you know, they're they're barely getting into space. They're sort of dipping their toes into the yeah. shallow end of the pool. <laughs> right. Yeah. Let's get real about them. Yeah. Right. Let's get real. If you want to go to Mars, have at it, Bezos. <laughs> Send me a postcard. <laughs> Just a quick follow up on that. The the idea... having a lover having a lovely time in Sedonia. <laughs> 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 or Sedona, as it might be. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you, uh, following up on that, this idea that we've been thrown off the moon mm -hmm. and told not to come back mm -hmm. uh, would explain 50 years of a lack of activity of sending a man back to the moon. What do you make of so many rumors along that line? Well, I think there may be something to it for the very simple reason, like I pointed out in, in Bastrop, is if you look at ancient lore about the quarantine zone around the Earth, right. one of the boundaries that they put is at the orbit of the moon. You know, this far and no further. You know, no, no troops beyond this point. And I strongly suspect that something like that kind of reasoning was behind the fact that when we send out our space probes, uh, to wherever, you know, we put these little plaques. We, you know, we're coming in peace for all mankind. Don't worry. We're just out here taking <laughs> pictures. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why did they do that? Yeah. You know, that's always been my question. And I suspect it's because they suspected that some of those ancient texts talking about wars and quarantine zones and so on may be true. And we better not take the risk if they're not. Wow. Absolutely. Yeah. Amazing. Miss Olivia. Okay. So this is my question. Um, so we have Bob Dean talking about, um, I think it was in 1964, um, seeing that there were four different types of aliens that they mm -hmm. knew about here. And one looked exactly like humans. Mm -hmm. Who is really running things here? Ha. I suspect to answer your question in a roundabout uh, way, I suspect that the beginning of the continuity of government operations planning in the 1950s was precisely not simply because they wanted to make sure that some government survived a nuclear exchange with the Soviet Union, but also because they suspected that there was a possibility of that kind of infiltration of the government. Oh, yeah. Um, I really do. I suspect, I, I have suspected for a long time, Olivia, that when they're doing all of these uh, genetic tests, you know, the most recent example being the COVID, you know, the swab, that they're really looking for DNA. They're looking for a DNA marker that nice. would, would identify people like that as a distinguishable population from us. You know, really... this came up in relation to airline scanners yeah. during the uh, TSA. They were like, why are you using these radiation x-rays when they have a radio scan that can do the same thing? And they were like, right. no, no, you know, and off the mm -hmm. head of Homeland Security went off and started a business doing this stuff. But mm -hmm. you made an excellent point, which is they're looking for something in the physiology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If, if there are, you know, if there are such people out there i call them the genetic cousins i have for a long time yes because you you read those ancient stories of of people tinkering with the human genome they look like us and they walk like us and, the, and they talk like us the only way you would be able to distinguish them would be the genetic marker so i think it's entirely possible so uh they're part of the genus homo but they're not homo sapien right right Right. Fascinating. It's amazing. And we know we know that a, a member of a genus can, in certain circumstances, interbreed with a different species, provided they're of the same genus. We Interesting. Do know that. Okay. So wow. you know, it makes entire sense. So so do they know? Do all of them know? Do all who of who know? Are? Do all of who know? Well, 
the aliens, the hybrid? I mean, I, I wonder, you know, could someone, could I be walking around and oh, not oh, know? Yes, I see. Oh, sure. sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I suspect that if you take those ancient stories of watchers and so on seriously, and I do, that you're going to find people like that not not associating with us deplorables. They're going to be much more interested in in watching the Angela Merkels and Richard Nixons of the world than they are, you know, a hack from South Dakota. So you're going to find them in those circles. And it's interesting to me, Olivia, Catherine Fitz has told the story many times on her website. She's told me this story that she was actually invited once in Washington to have lunch with an alien. Yeah, you know, just totally seriously. Yeah, you know, nothing, yes. no, no ifs, ands, or buts. So you know, they may be aware of them. I don't know, but um, I don't think you and I are are in danger of hobnobbing with these people. <laughs> you know what's amazing about that is she would have had a remarkable <laughs> lunch. Let's face it. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you know, it's true. But we've seen those stories before, everything from Val Thor and all the rest of it. And right. some of it, there's just too much evidence of these people and these interactions. I mean, sure, some oh, of yeah. it's psyops, some of it's fantasy, you know, you have junk conspiracy, whatever. But then there's just... There's this, that sliver of strange it, stuff. It is. And, you know, men in black, women in black, you know, there's there's all of this lore out there of people meeting very, very strange people. Yes. That don't that don't seem to respond in, in a normal human way right. to certain situations. And, you know, that's another key. That's another signature. But to be absolutely sure, you'd have to have the genome and, and be able to sequence it and find anything anomalous but that's the only, that's the only way but behavior certainly um, absolutely and you know it's interesting guys like frank edwards yep. wrote extensively about those types mm -hmm. uh, of people um he he had incredibly high connections politically he was a yep. good friend of harry truman yeah, <laughs> yeah. wow yeah. uh last question miss olivia uh put easy one pulp buzz uh has dr farrell ever seen a ufo Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I've only seen one. And it was when I was um, living in Spearfish, South Dakota. There was a little 24-hour convenience store a couple of blocks away from my apartment. And one night, about it was about 2.30 in the morning, I walked down and got myself a soda and was walking back. And I was walking Shiloh. <laughs> I was walking up a hill, and in the distance, you could see Spearfish Mountain kind of silhouetted against the stars. And I looked up, and I saw this little thing go, whoop. Mm. And I looked back. I didn't think anything about it at the time. I took a few more steps, and, I, and then I stopped and said, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Because what I had seen was this little, I don't know how to describe it, it was not circular or elliptical or anything like that. It was kind of like an arrowhead and it was strobing huh. and it was strobing in such a way that the shape was changing as it was strobing. It still maintained the arrowhead shape. But it was kind of flickering back and forth and it went zip. And when I realized what I'd just seen, I stopped and I listened because it had darted behind Spearfish Mountain, which was about eight miles away. Uh, it's a 6,500-foot-tall mountain. And it had darted behind that, and it was moving very, very quickly. And so I stopped when I realized what I'd seen to listen because Ellsworth Air Force Base is just down in Rapid City. So, you know, there's military planes flying around the Black Hills all the time. So I stopped to listen to see if it may have been a helicopter. There was no sound. Mm -hmm. I listened for a jet sound. There was absolutely no sound. Wow. None. It was completely silent. And it was, in my opinion, moving far too quickly to have been a helicopter. And if it was that low, uh, you know, with the B-1 bombers at uh, Ellsworth Air Force Base, it would have made a sound. So I, I think it was a UFO of some type. Did you have kind of a strange feeling when you were looking at it? Well, again, I looked and I saw it, you know, and I didn't think anything about it. It just went zip. You know, I thought, oh, that's a meteor. 
And then I stopped and realized, no, it's strobing. You know, meteors don't strobe. <laughs> <laughs> so. Wow. Um, you know, I, my last thing I want to ask on that is, and I don't think I've ever asked you this, which is around the UFO subject over and over again, what you run up against is missing time. Yeah. Even in sightings, people yeah. say, I saw something, I don't know what happened. And there's always an assumption, oh, you were abducted, and that's where the missing time comes from. Mm -hmm. um, what is missing time? Oh, a good question. Um, I think to be to be short about it, because I do have to go, but to be very short about it, I don't think missing time is simply a, a loss of memory. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's a, a memory that's been intentionally altered. And the reason why is if you're dealing if you're dealing with a genuine hyperdimensional encounter of some sort, it's going to alter the timeline in some fundamental sense. We're, we're back to Mandela effect in a certain way. Yes. Uh, it's going to alter it in a fundamental way. Now I do think there are cases obviously where you have people that have had memories implanted or tinkered with after the fact. But in some of these cases, you know, I, I read uh, David Jacobs' book, and some of those cases that he outlines are just very, very bizarre. Yeah. And and there's no way that I can think of Dr. Jacobs sitting there evilly implanting all these strange <laughs> tales. And no, it's just you know, that's not a professor of Temple University you know, sort of <laughs> sort of thing to be doing. Exactly. So. Uh, I, I do think there's some sort of fundamental physics behind this this time loss phenomenon. I've had the same thing happen to me. Really? Uh, oh, yeah. I've had some very strange skips. Uh, one of them was out in San Mateo, California, and I went up to my room, put my key in the door, and it didn't open. And I knew, you know, I knew exactly how many staircases I had to climb to my room. And I climbed that amount of staircases. But I kept trying. I eventually looked at the number on the door. And I was one floor above where I should have been. And I, you know, how, how did that happen? I didn't walk that number of stairs. You know, it's just bizarre. You know, I've had, <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, you know, just weird stuff. You know. uh, well, San Mateo was an interesting thing. That was the secret space conference. Yeah. Uh, yeah. that'll do it. Joseph, incredible. Of course, your work is available at GizaDeathStar.com. Yep. Uh, and, uh, your books are available there as well. Mm -hmm. People can join the website. Mm -hmm. And of course you do uh, all these video and the different web seminars that you do there at the site. Uh, people can join. I know people are eagerly anticipating your next book. Whatever that happens. Whenever that may be. <laughs> <laughs> I want to recommend around the things that we talked about today. Microcosm and, and Medium, uh -huh. which is a, a remarkable book that you put out last year. And then um, one of the older ones, probably The Cosmic War, to give that oh, yeah. setup of that early yeah. piece. But just remarkable yeah. uh, work. And I think that we got, you know, so much of the Mars stuff out that got deleted and <laughs> torn down last time. So thank you so much. Well, you know where to find me the next time you want to impersonate a historical event. So. <laughs> <laughs> There. We'll make it the Kennedy assassination. Oh, <laughs> All right. Take it easy. Daniel. Good to see you, Joseph. Yep, thanks for having me. Have guys. a great one. Thank yep, you. you too. Yep. Bye bye. <laughs> okay. Our thanks. perfect timing, right? <laughs> now think about it. This is amazing because, of course, uh, Joseph Farrell, the two different episodes they got pulled down and they dealt with everything that we talked about today. But think about it. What was it? And what we talked about, there's something, there's some factor that um, made them want to take it down and create this ridiculous excuse because it wasn't their usual reasons for taking things down. You know, there's no hate speech or anything like that in there. So I had to think to myself over and over again, and it feels to me that there's something uh, in the work of Dr. Farrell relating to Mars that created this in the first place. Um, so we've been going deep with Mars. And, you know, when I was talking about it last night, I mentioned Gigi Young really tuning into this early and doing a lot about Mars. And then she and I talking uh, about Mars and then this becoming just a, a central piece of what is happening in relation to uh, these groups that are trying to control the human origins narrative and using people like 
Musk and all the rest is just these kind of bloated billionaires on top, which they've done before with Howard Hughes and, and, and others. Um, and that's all the smoke and mirror stuff. The question is, what are they up to? And part of the steganography we got last night um, with the baseball diamond and home plate and the spirit rover and on Mars, that was remarkable. So then to have uh, Dr. Farrell come in today and then lay out that whole Mars argument again, now it feels like everything is on time. And it's interesting to me also that those videos got taken down just before that UAP conference in Washington, D.C. that had the illustrious uh, director of national intelligence, April Haynes, along with Avi Loeb and all the rest of it. It's like they didn't want this competing thing out there. Whatever it happens to be, it was unusual uh, for sure. And there's all sorts of things that we do um, here with the work that we put out where you know we could be censored at any moment. So it's just the way that it goes with this. And of course, my general policy when people have said, well, just don't deal with YouTube, do something else. Well, you know, I have to say, I, I started this stuff because I wanted to do my own research and I didn't want to be encumbered by that journalistic uh, process where the publisher nixes a story. And I'd seen that happen over and over again. I had no desire to be in that mainstream media world. And so now it seems to me, you know, that they're trying to get me to censor myself again. And it's not going to happen. So I'm just going to keep doing the reports that I do. And, you know, we're going to bring this stuff forward. And if groups uh, like YouTube or whatever these platforms, whether it's Twitter or Facebook, you know, they're, they already do things to sabotage the rankings of the channel and all that stuff. I just don't spend a lot of time on it. As long as I can put my message out, I would do it on an iPhone. Uh, so I'm just going to continue to do the types of reports and the dark journalism that we do. And I'm not going to move platforms or anything else. What's going to happen is if they want to remove the work that I do from their platforms, then it'll be an action of censorship on their part. I'm not going to make it, you know, something that I do. Uh, so that's kind of my position on it. But it is so great uh, to have Dr. Farrell here tonight. Just incredible. And what a great crowd that we have. A really this. amazing crowd. Tell me what are those some of those questions you had left over. Oh, I've got tons. <laughs> uh, well, I wanted to ask um there's a lot about antarctica as oh always. yes we'll do another show with uh dr farrell on antarctica i will say this what's interesting about um so many of the things that we've been witnessing is some of the weirdness that we're seeing about mars with them uh referencing mars over and over again it was happening at the end of the obama administration in relation to antarctica and we remember John Kerry went there and Buzz Aldrin and all the rest of it. So certainly there was a lot going on uh, in relation to that. We are going to be back next Friday uh, with X series episode 113. I'm going to consider this part two of what we did last night for episode 112. And we had a great response uh, going through that. And um, there's no question that the... Um, you know, this statement by the director of national intelligence about UFOs buzzing warships and that they are probably extraterrestrial and things like that represent a break in what the establishment has been doing up to now, which is dancing around that question. This is a much more direct approach. And we saw that also from the NASA director, Bill Nelson. So they're up to something. And I think um, it's in our best interest to try to connect the dots between what they're up to with Mars and then pushing the UAP threat here. Uh, so that's a, the UFO threat is their thing, and they keep trying to brand this term UAP. It's not really working, <laughs> working out for them. Um, but one of the things that Dr. Farrell said that I think is so interesting is that he said he didn't feel that their plans were working out. That's pretty wild. Um, and I, I share that as well, which is some of the whitewash is not going according to plan. So we'll see what their plan B is. As I said before, uh, you know, I feel like the UFO op is the, the big thing they've had up their sleeve and it solves a lot of problems because they don't, then they don't have to explain the 75 years of intense secrecy around that as well. Uh, so I think that's kind of important. Mm -hmm. Yes. What do you got? I was just going to say their brutality is being exposed, right? Right. Which is what they don't want. Right. Exactly. 
That's exactly true. I would I would actually reword that and say their lack of humanity. Lack of which humanity. Which may have a double meaning. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was great to spend some Saturday uh, time with everyone. I hope some of our European friends who usually can't catch the show live because it's late for them got to check in with us tonight. I'm going to do a few shout outs here. Uh, well, Before you do, you do that, um, I've been posting the link to part two in BitChute. When is part three going to be out? Uh, well, we have uh, part three of that video in the subscriber section. We have the audio for it, but they actually went into the private video forum and took that one down. <laughs> so we're recalibrating that. Sometime this weekend, we'll have part three. So, but if, uh, if somebody wants the audio version, it's available now. For it subscribers. is exactly. Okay. Yeah. And uh, of course, part two is also available there. We put a backup copy of part two with Dr. Farrell on, um, Bit shoot as well. So yeah. we did, we got to cover a lot with Dr. Farrell between those three videos and today. So certainly there's a clean sweep going on there. Uh, but the action of them taking down both of those videos and then taking them out of private servers is kind of remarkable. So um, there was a reason <laughs> basically they wanted to do that. But we have some people who went through Super Chat. You want to go Tons. through those? Okay. First of all, um, Everybody wants to know your bit shoot channel's name. It's just Dark Journalist, of course. And on uh, Telegram is the other one that people have been joining us on. And that's real Dark Journalist because there are all kinds of like fluff Dark Journalist channels there. And um, I usually don't pay attention too much to that one. But I, you know, with Telegram now, it's been a very good alternative to put out there. So I recommend if you're on Telegram, look for real dark journalist. <laughs> okay, just gonna throw this out that Shash Kila wants to know, is there any way I can stop PayPal from resubbing me to DJ and send a check? A lot of people want oh, to what you do is you PayPal. send you would send an email to admin at darkjournalist.com and they'll take care of that for you. No problem at all. Okay. Um, so A D M I N at darkjournalist.com. All right. So there. super chatters. Super All chat. Right. St this is going to take a while. <laughs> Steven, Debbie McAdoo, Ho Boo, uh, Bolsla Toporek, Kersicella, Eurythmia Spun, Deborah Forbes, Kat Gray, Jamie Linton, Doreen Hewitt, Austin Nichols, Mad Max, Joshua Whelan, Luke Walker, Carol Andrews, Daryl Dothero, Josh Randall, Jim Sarge, 3ID, Glenn Miller, Little Green Men, Nimza Flugzug, uh, Dwell Wayne, Shazam, a cult fan, Buster Blue Sun, Sean Jock, Johnny Ricardo, Man in the Mirror, Thomas Tyson, Gil and Joy R, and D Falcon 61. Thank you so much. Wow, remarkable. Thanks so much for being with us and supporting us and supporting the work we do here on this program. Uh, we really appreciate that, and we appreciate our subscribers and the people who get behind uh, the work that we do here. We will be back next Friday with a new episode, and you might be seeing us actually during the week because there's some uh, breaking stories that are happening in relation to uh, this whole UAP thing that they're trying to gin up. Um, you know, we made a, a kind of a strong case last night about this Mars site um, and the NASA scientists using obscure baseball history to cover their bases. This is something you're going to see us do a lot of work on because it's steganography that's opening up. And uh, I, I can tell you that, you know, uh, Gigi Young and others are going to be helping us get to the bottom of all this. But it's just starting and we have kind of a big piece of steganography there. Let's see if they continue to use this satchel page Thing to get into this uh, Mars ruins idea. It is interesting because they're going to come forward at a certain point and they're getting gearing up with this human origin story rewrite. That's really why it's crucial for us to be, you know, locked in really well with people on the UFO file side and locked in really well with people who know the deep politics and then those who know things around spirituality and religion and mysticism. This thing all works together. You can't really get a full picture without going into each of these different uh, sides and understanding the kind of mosaic of, of the full uh, picture. But they are, this is where they're working. This is the area that they're working in. And we have to kind of pay attention to that. As Dr. Farrell was pointing out, they're gearing up uh, to change the narrative and he's seeing it as the UFO threat uh, aspect that they're going to use. That's the thing that we've been warning about here. They got cold feet last June about this, probably because Elizondo wasn't the person that they thought 
on the public stage could pull it off. So now they're working uh, Averill, who is uh, the director of national intelligence, but she's a chip off the old block of John Brennan. And he, he is somebody who could pull this off. So um, these are the types of things that we're going to be watching along with the things that we naturally do here in the X series. I'll do a few shout outs for everyone who showed up and thank you, Richard Weber. <laughs> it's great to see you out there. Thomas Marzek, Gigi Abin, Abby Lynn. There we go. Three itty bitty. I like that. Uh, a cult fan. It's good to see you out there, sir. Man in the mirror. I like that. Love from Australia. We really appreciate that. And we, God bless you in Australia. Yeah. Oh, well, some incredible things are happening. And uh, as I've said over and over again, I think it's an international crisis and it should be on the top of the kind of UN agenda and all these countries should be looking at it because the things that they're doing to the <laughs> citizens in Australia is beyond belief. If I could parachute myself down there and help you, I would. I, you know, I, I, I said at a certain point, it's going to come to people sending in, you know, food and armaments and everything else, because it's just absolutely absurd. And don't tell me that Pine Gap, uh, which is the Australian Area 51, isn't related to that, because that's something that we control completely. Um, Frank Monday, it's good to see you. Karen Pearson. Wayne Peak, Ronan Returns, Olivia Wings, girl, look at that, you're right in there. Dark Navigator, thank you for being here. Scarlet Fire, Shazam, Nimza, it's great to see you there, sir. Chris A, the Hawthorne Dimension. I know that that's actually Carly uh, with her new Hawthorne Dimension. We're going to find out what that is. I'm telling you, we're going to know. Uh, hopefully, She's going to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> Bethany Green, it's great to see you out there. Um, just remarkable. Thomas Tyson. Thomas Tyson is the limerick he writer. Is. So not, I'm sure we can have a goodbye limerick from Thomas. Tricky Vicky, it's great to see you out there. Brenda Fisher. Carolyn Cat Goida. Oh, I love it. Batter up Troll Satchel. 13 says adopt an Aussie. What a great idea. <laughs> it is a great idea. I always had this incredible uh, vision. I've never been to Australia, but I always had this incredible vision of Australia and uh, was thinking of visiting. We discussed in 2016 a conference mm. in Australia. So all of these kind of things around uh, that have been going on there, absolute shock. And we do um, want to bring more attention to it. And we certainly will. David Tormina, it's great to see you out there. Great work. Open source on Twitter around X themes and other things. Really interesting. Josh Randall, it's great to see you out there. Teresa Von Wagner. Wow. Just a great crowd tonight. Bill Ferry. Thank you, sir. We really appreciate that. Uh, I know Kate's out there tonight. It's great to see you. Gypsy Moon. Thank you. Great show. I appreciate that very much. It was great to be here with all of you. That's the thing. And the fact that we could coordinate it. We didn't know when Dr. Farrell was going to be available. We thought maybe last night. And then he said, well, I'm available today, you know, and uh, we can do it at five o'clock. So that's what we took a chance and did it. And uh, boy, it was great to see him. And it sort of got that whole thing about getting those videos taken out. Uh, we just exercised that completely. Um, the thing that I brought up uh, tonight in relation to what Judge Napolitano said about the JFK records and Trump telling him we couldn't let those out. You wouldn't believe what's in there. Um, this is something that everyone needs to be on top of on the journalism side and apply the pressure and find out exactly what he was talking about. Now we know, here's another thing, even if they don't release the records, Trump himself can actually come forward. Uh, so true. he's got cards to play on that. Uh, especially if they start doing more monkey business with him. And one of the main monkey business players, of course, was our friend uh, DNI Haynes. She was part of that whole false Russia narrative when they were trying to get uh, Trump not only out of office, but get him out of the running before he even got in. So, um, you know, whether you're pro or anti, whatever it is, nobody should be subjected to that type of activity by the central intelligence agency you want to field that last minute question what is it uh <laughs> from <laughs> turd ferguson <laughs> uh was trump's apparent message to napolitano about jfk made because those documents revealed info that we already suspect or is it even more sinister uh i think there's something significant now in those files that we hadn't counted on and um i'd heard about you know 
something being preserved in there. And I never, I always thought that was kind of, uh, you know, just wishful thinking. And I always thought, oh, the CIA will scrub all that stuff before it comes out. There may have been a mechanism because of the CIA director that the Kennedys installed uh, at the end after they threw Dulles out. It's possible that they applied a mechanism uh, in there that was kind of like an Easter egg. And um, obviously something's in there because if you, if you go back and listen, and I'd like to talk to Judge Napolitano about this, the force with which Trump was saying it to him, he said, Andrew, I, I can't. You wouldn't believe what's in there. So this is obviously something very significant. And like I said, you know, we know that the Central Intelligence Agency was behind that. There's enough evidence on the table. So it's not that. Um, there's, there's obviously some other piece in there. And I wouldn't be surprised if it related directly to the UFO file. And that's exactly what uh, Dr. Farrell suspected tonight. Thank you, everyone, for Hold being on. here. Yes. Thomas Tyson came up with a limerick for oh, you. Let's go for okay. it. Okay. Uh, there once was a journalist called Dark. His work was no walk in the park. He would lay it all out with confident clout, and he certainly left his mark. <laughs> Nicely done, sir. Nobody does it quite like you. Um, thank you very much. Head trip. Thank you very much for being there. Charles Milligan. I don't think the fake invasion is happening now. Mars being handed back to the indigenous reptiloids. Hmm. Well, you know, interesting. <laughs> DJ, how do you think they hid mechanism? What could it be? Yeah. Um, that's referring to the JFK records. It's a real good question. This is interesting to me. I think that there is a way that they could have done it. And now that I've heard Napolitano's conversation, you can understand 58 years later why they're still holding the records back. Because if they had just scrubbed the records, they wouldn't worry about it. Um, dark Truth, Kevin B., Ivan Langley, great to see all of you here tonight with us. We'll be back with you next Friday. And like I said, you're going to have another surprise during the week. <laughs> <laughs> and Miss Olivia? Anything else that you caught tonight? No, that's pretty much it. Fantastic. Nicely done. Incredible thank questions uh, and dealing with it on the spot. And thank you for you know being able to spontaneously respond uh, on short notice with this. We will be back. And uh, thanks so much for being there. Remember to go to darkjournalist.com and sign up for our newsletter. That keeps us in touch. It's a free newsletter, and it allows us to get around so much of the censorship that we've been seeing. Hopefully, this video doesn't get censored, uh, but you never know. In any case, we were back and better than ever. We will see you all uh, next week. Have a great weekend. And um, remember, also, if you want to subscribe to Dark Journalist, you can do that at darkjournalist.com. And we are going to have some very interesting, fun surprises for our subscribers, including the announcement uh, that there may be some events coming up as well. These are some things that are in discussion now. We'll tell you more about those. And uh, we have some great interviews coming up for you as well. So thank you very much for being here. We will see you all next week. You know, it says end broadcast, but you know, it never really ends. Nope. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Okay. God bless. Have a good night. Jelly Jones. There you go. Thanks, everybody.